the Assyrian Empire's Capitals, The History and Legacy of Nineveh, Asher, and Nimrod. Written by Charles River Editors. Narrated by Colin Pluxman. The Geographic Location of Ancient Assyria Before any historical study of ancient Assyrian culture can be conducted, a brief geographical survey and identification of Assyria itself is warranted. The name Assyria is actually a modern derivation of the name of the ancient city of Assur, Ashur in English, which is where Assyrian culture began. The ancient city of Ashur was located approximately 100 kilometers south of modern Mosul, located along the banks of the Tigris River in what is today the state of Iraq. As such, Ashur was part of Greater Mesopotamia and the Fertile Crescent region, which allowed the city to grow in terms of both culture and population. Assyria was provided with plenty of water from the Tigris River, and it was also on the fringes of the rainfall zone, which meant that it was not totally dependent on irrigation. Location allowed the population of Assyria to grow, but its culture flourished due to its proximity to southern Mesopotamia, particularly cities such as Babylon, Ur, and Larsa. The Assyrians encountered and adopted concepts already in use by their neighbors, including writing, which spurred the Assyrians' advancement and has since made it much easier for people to study them. The Assyrians' development of writing allows current historians to read about the empire's affairs, but it also allowed the Assyrians themselves the ability to document their own history. The Assyrians' idea of history was essentially the same as that of their Babylonian neighbors to the south, and involved ideas such as destiny that were manifested in the past and projected into the future. As such, the Assyrians' view of history was fundamentally different than the modern view. Modern notions of history are largely derived from the ancient Greeks, who believed that history should be written as a narrative and serve to teach those who read it. Modern views of history are largely divorced from ideas such as divine intervention, but to the Assyrians it was the divine that made history, and as a result they believed mortal failures were the result of not following divine law. In other words, history to the Assyrians was a theocratic history. Despite Assyrian historiography's long and apparently unchanging background from early Mesopotamian origins, the Middle Assyrian period witnessed a major change in Assyrian historiography. During the reign of Tiglath-Pileser I, circa 1114 to 1076, the Assyrians began to write royal annals, which consisted of chronologically detailed accounts of military expeditions and royal hunts. The manner and context in which these annals were first composed is unknown, but it is possible these reports were initially meant to be letters from the kings to their gods. The annals were incredibly specific in regards to geographic locales and ethnic groups affected by military campaigns and they also graphically depicted the brutal nature of Assyrian warfare. The location and subsequent discovery of many of these annals was in the library of King Ashurbanipal, 668-631 BC. Over 5,000 cuneiform documents, which detailed affairs of the state and historical annals, were recovered from the ruins of Ashurbanipal's library. The discovery proved yet again that the Assyrians, far from simply being bloodthirsty warriors, placed a premium on literature and history. The Assyrian historical annals may have been the most interesting and entertaining form of Assyrian documents, but the royal kinglists have helped modern scholars accurately recreate Assyrian chronology. The Assyrians, like the Babylonians to the south and the Egyptians to the west, kept records of all their kings in what are known today as king lists. King lists could be as simple as an ordered listing of all kings, or they could include such things as length of reign and other important facts. At this point, three Assyrian king lists are known to exist. One list ends in 935 BC, while the other two end in 745 and 722 BC. In its earliest phase, the city of Ashur, and therefore Assyria itself, 
consisted of no more than the city and its immediate environment. While people are familiar with Assyria and the Assyrians, the city's name itself is interesting and a point of scholarly debate because it is also the name of the primary Assyrian god. It is probable that in archaic times the locals attributed divine attributes to a rocky outcrop named Ashur above the Tigris River, which is where the city then got its name. Whether the god or the city actually came first may never be known for sure, but the city developed into a substantial state around the year 2000 BC, and as Ashur developed and grew, it was eventually conquered by a king from southern Mesopotamia who initiated a long series of royal connections between Ashur and Babylon that would last for centuries. The Babylonian conqueror of Ashur was named Shamsi Adad, and although he was from Babylon and an ethnic Amorite, he was accepted by the Assyrians and placed in their list of kings. In fact, Shamsi Adad was the first Assyrian king to take the title Sharum, king, which set the precedent for all of his successes. The Assyrians recognized Shamsi Adad as their first king, but interestingly, they also recognized his Babylonian origin. Shamsi Adad, the son of Ilu Kabkabi, went away to Babylonia in the time of Naram Sin. In the eponymy of Ibn Adad, Shamsi Adad came back from Babylonia. He seized Ekelate. He stayed in Ekelate for three years. In the eponymy of Atamar Ishtar, Shamsi Adad came up from Ekelate and removed Erishu, son of Naram Sin, from the throne. Inscriptions from the reign of Shamsi Adad demonstrate that although he was not from Ashur, he gave praise to the god Ashur and beautified the city. One inscription read, Shamsi Adad, king of the universe, builder of the temple of Asur, who devotes his energies to the land between the Tigris and Euphrates. At the command of Asur, who loves him, he whose name Anu and Enlil had named for great deeds, above the kings who had gone before the temple of Enlil, which Erishum, son of Ilushuma, had built, and whose structure had fallen to ruins. The temple of Enlil, my lord, a magnificent shrine, a spacious abode, the dwelling of Enlil, my lord, which had been planned according to the plan of wise architects in my city Asur. I roofed that temple with cedars. In the doors I placed door leaves of cedar, covered with silver and gold. The walls of that temple, laid upon silver, gold, lapis lazuli, and sandu stone, with cedar oil, choice oil, honey and butter, I sprinkled the mud walls. This passage also demonstrates another precedent that Shamsi Adad would set for later Assyrian kings, the use of the epithet ruler of the universe. Shamsi Adad was the first great Assyrian king, but what made Assyria great during the old Assyrian period was its economic prowess. The Assyrians were able to develop far-flung and sophisticated trade networks in the late 3rd and early 2nd millennia BC that would help establish Ashur as a major urban center in the ancient Near East. A number of documents written in Akkadian cuneiform were excavated in Anatolia, modern Turkey, and have provided modern scholars with enough information to actually understand and recreate the trade routes and systems used by the Assyrians. For example, the documents show that Assyrian merchants developed trading towns in Anatolia where goods from Mesopotamia and Iran were traded for goods in Anatolia. There were two types of Assyrian trading towns. The Karum, which meant key or harbor in Akkadian, was the primary trading center of a city, while the Wabatum was a smaller trading center that functioned in a subordinate manner to the nearest Karum. Naturally, the city of Ashur acted as the central point in the trade routes. Tin from Iran and finished textiles from Babylon and southern Mesopotamia traveled through the city to the Karum city of Kanesh in Anatolia. This journey from Ashur to Kanesh lasted about 50 days, and was impossible during winter, as the passages through the Taurus Mountains were blocked due to ice and snow. 
the Assyrian merchants carried the tin and textiles on donkeys that they all traded, including the donkeys, when they arrived in Anatolia for silver or gold that they then brought back to Ashur. One of the most interesting aspects of the Assyrian trade network was that it was carried out largely by private entrepreneurs. The Assyrian king was not directly involved, and it's unclear why the Assyrian king did not take a more dominant role in the merchant activities of his people during the old Assyrian period. Scholars have theorized that Assyrian kings might not have wanted to upset a system that worked, or that the kings were not yet powerful enough to influence such intricate networks. As impressive and great as they were, the economic activities of the Assyrians would take a back seat to their military endeavors when the kings of the Middle Assyrian period came to power. The Middle Assyrian period is the era during which Assyrian culture, as it is recognized today, truly developed. Between the 14th and 11th centuries BC, the Assyrians were able to expand their borders from a city-state based around Ashur, and in the process, the empire became a major regional power in the Near East, not to mention a military juggernaut. The Assyrians also developed a sophisticated corpus of written material during this period, and became exceptional diplomats. Since Middle Assyrian society became dominated by the military, it had something similar to the feudal structure that dominated Europe in the Middle Ages. Most of the arable land in Assyria was owned by the king, who gave concessions to men that performed admirably in military campaigns. Although the expansion of the Assyrian state during the Middle Assyrian period was fairly gradual, the rule of Ashur Ubalit I is generally viewed as the beginning of the period, and also when the expansion began. Ashur Ubalit I was able to take advantage of troubles outside the Assyrian kingdom by annexing territories to Assyria's east after the Hittites attacked the kingdom of the Mitanni, and by the rule of the Assyrian king to Kulti Ninuta I. The Assyrians had consumed the Mitanni kingdom east of the Euphrates and were well on the way to wiping out that entire kingdom. The Assyrians became known for their military prowess during the Middle Assyrian period but their growth and imperial status was due as much to their diplomatic efforts. In the late 15th century BC, the major kingdoms of the Near East expanded their borders until they met and occasionally overlapped one another. The Egyptians, Hittites and Babylonians fought border battles with each other over colonies, but they also traded rare commodities and sometimes royal princesses. The collection of Near Eastern empires that existed from approximately the 14th to the 11th centuries is often referred to as the Great Powers Club or the period of great empires. The Assyrians entered the stage later than the Egyptians, Hittites and Babylonians, but by the late 13th century BC they were members of the club. When the Hittite king, Tudhaliya IV, concluded a treaty with the vassal state of Amuru, he listed the Assyrians as one of the great powers. Today, much is known about the geopolitical situation during this period thanks to a large number of Akkadian cuneiform tablets that were discovered in the ruins of the ancient Egyptian city of Amarna in 1887. The discovery of these tablets, known today as the Amarna Letters, revealed that Akkadian was the language of diplomacy at the time, and cuneiform was the style of writing used in official correspondence between leaders. The letters also revealed that the geopolitical situation in the ancient Near East was much more complicated than many believed. The major powers all referred to one another in their correspondences as brother and took a tone of equity, while the smaller states, which were usually relegated to some type of colonial status, had to prostrate themselves in writing to the larger states. The late second millennium BC was a period of unrest in the Near East, especially as the Bronze Age was swept away and replaced by the Iron Age. The transition to the Iron Age proved to be especially violent, and it brought about the end of the Great Powers Club, a mysterious coalition of warrior tribes, known collectively as the Sea Peoples, ravaged the coastal kingdoms of the eastern Mediterranean, and they destroyed the kingdoms of Ugarit and Hatti, and nearly destroyed Egypt as well. 
Since they were located further inland from the Mediterranean coast, the Assyrians did not suffer as much from the Sea People's attacks, but the empire was not totally immune to the general situation either. A group of Semitic-speaking people, known as the Arameans, began to attack and ravage numerous Mesopotamian cities around this same time. The Aramean raids became the primary focus of tiglat pileser's reign, a fact mentioned in the historical annals. With the help of Assur, my lord, I led forth my chariots and warriors, and went into the desert, into the midst of the Alami, Arameans, enemies of Assur, my lord, I marched. The country from Suhi to the city of Karchemish, in the land of Hatti, I raided in one day. I slew their troops, their spoil, their goods, and their possessions, in countless numbers, I carried away. The rest of their forces, which had fled from before the terrible weapons of Assur, my lord, and had crossed over the Euphrates, in pursuit of them I crossed the Euphrates in vessels made of skins. Six of their cities, which lay at the foot of the mountain of Beshri, I captured, I burned with fire, I laid them waste, I destroyed them. Their spoil, their goods, and their possessions, I carried away to my city Assur. However, despite tiglat pileser's best efforts, the Aramean hordes eventually reduced the Assyrian Empire to its original heartland around Ashur by 1050 BC. The Arameans and the general collapse of the period may have reduced the land the Assyrians held, but Robert Drews has argued that the use of infantry helped them survive the collapse, whereas others, such as the Hittites, did not. The historian's History of the World described Assyrian infantry. The spear of the Assyrian footman was short, scarcely exceeding the height of a man. That of the horseman appears to have been considerably longer. The shaft was probably of some strong wood, and did not consist of a reed, like that of the modern Arab lance. It will probably never be definitively determined how and why the Assyrians survived the collapse of the Bronze Age, but Drew's argument brings to light an important aspect of Assyrian culture that would define them in their golden age, their military prowess. When the Assyrians crawled out of Ashur after the interregnum imposed on the region by the Arameans and Sea Peoples, they quickly established themselves as the most powerful people in the Near East, and ushered in their Golden Age. Generally, the chronology of the Neo-Assyrian period is divided by modern scholars into two phases, with the first being the 9th century, when the empire was re-established, and the second lasting from the middle of the 8th century until the empire's demise. There are numerous extant primary sources from this period, not only because the Assyrians became meticulous compilers of their annals, but also because other peoples, most notably the Israelites, also wrote about the Assyrians. Beautiful and detailed pictorial reliefs have also been excavated from the royal palaces in Ashur, Nineveh, and Kala that depict numerous battlefield tactics and weapons in great detail. One of Assyria's most important leaders during the period was Sargon II, who restructured the Assyrian state internally, conducted military campaigns almost every year, and incorporated the conquered territories into provinces. In fact, one of the most notable changes he made to the Assyrian system was to increase the number of provinces from 12 to 25, which decreased the power of the provincial governors. One of the most important provinces within the Assyrian Empire was Samaria. Also known as Israel, Samaria repeatedly rebelled against their Assyrian overlords, but in 722 the Assyrians overran Samaria once and for all, killing countless numbers and sending most of the rest of its inhabitants into forced exile. The events of Samaria's fall were chronicled in the Assyrian annals from the reign of Sargon II and the Old Testament, and although the two sources present the event from different perspectives, they corroborate each other for the most part, and together present a reliable account of the situation. The Assyrian record reads, I besieged and conquered Samaria, led away as booty 27,290 inhabitants of it. I formed from among them a contingent of fifty chariots, 
and made remaining inhabitants assume their social positions. I installed over them an officer of mine, and imposed upon them the tribute of the former king. Hanno, king of Gaza, and also Sibé, the Turton of Egypt, Musuri, set out from Rapihu against me to deliver a decisive battle. I defeated them. Sibé ran away, afraid when he only heard the noise of my approaching army, and has not been seen again. Hanno I captured personally. I received tribute from Piru of Musuru, from Samsi, Queen of Arabia, and Itamar the Sabaean, gold in dust form, horses and camels. The Assyrian account reveals that others in the region, namely the Egyptians, were involved on Israel's side to a certain extent, but it is uncertain how many troops were sent with Sibe, because this account cannot be corroborated by any Egyptian source. Perhaps the most striking piece of information is that nearly 30,000 Israelites were removed from the region. The forced removal of rebellious populations by the Assyrians was a brutal but effective tactic that they commonly used, and is discussed more thoroughly later. The biblical account of the fall of Samaria is quite similar to the Assyrian, but with a few minor differences. The account states, And it came to pass in the fourth year of King Hezekiah, which was the seventh year of Hoshea, a son of Elah, king of Israel, that Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against Samaria and besieged it. And at the end of three years they took it. Even in the sixth year of Hezekiah, that is the ninth year of Hoshea, king of Israel, Samaria was taken, and the king of Assyria did carry away Israel unto Assyria, and put them in Hala, and in Habor by the river of Gozan, and in the city of the Medes. The biblical account fills in a couple of details, including the duration of the siege, three years, the name of the king of Israel, Hoshea, the name of the king of the southern kingdom of Judah, Hezekiah, and that Shalmaneser V was the Assyrian king who first led the siege. At first glance, it would appear that the two sources are conflicted over the Assyrian king, but the primary source, known as the Babylonian Chronicle, was written as a combination king list annal, may help shed light on this chronological quagmire. The source states, On the twenty-fifth day of the month Tebet, Shalmaneser ascended the throne in Assyria and Akkad. He ravaged Samaria. The fifth year, Shalmaneser died in the month of Tebet. For five years, Shalmaneser ruled Akkad and Assyria. On the twelfth day of the month Tebet, Sargon ascended the throne in Assyria. Thus, the meticulous record-keeping and keen sense of history of the Assyrians helps clear the confusion somewhat. It was Shalmaneser who initially led the siege of Samaria, but he died during the process. So it was his successor, Sargon II, who completed the task with brutal efficiency. The circumstances surrounding the transfer of power between the Assyrian kings is unknown, but many modern scholars of the ancient Near East believe that Sargon replaced Shalmaneser in a coup d'etat and subsequently claimed the capture of Samaria for himself. To the biblical writers, the Assyrian king who destroyed Israel was not as important as the event and its historical and theological significance. The Assyrian siege and destruction of Samaria seemed to set into motion a chain of events of similarly brutal sieges that the Assyrian war machine meted out to rebellious provinces and any others who stood in its way in the late 8th and early 7th centuries BC. A few years after he destroyed Israel, Sargon turned his attention to one of Samaria's neighbors, the coastal city of Ashdod. According to the annals from the Assyrian king of Khorsabad, Iamani, the king of Ashdod decided to abandon his subordinate status to Assyria in favor of Egypt, which was ruled by the Nubians at the time. The text states, Iamani from Ashdod, afraid of my armed force, left his wife and children and fled to the frontier of Musru, which belongs to Meluha, and hid there like a thief. I installed an officer of mine as governor over his entire large country and its prosperous inhabitants, thus aggrandizing again the territory belonging to Ashur, the king of the gods. The terror-inspiring glamour of Ashur, my lord, overpowered, however, the king of Meluha, 
and he threw him, that is, Iamani, in fetters on hands and feet, and sent him to me to Assyria. I conquered and sacked the towns Shinutu and Samaria, and all Israel. I caught, like a fish, the Greek Ionians who live on islands amidst the western sea. At first, this text appears somewhat confusing, but a closer examination reveals not only the Assyrians' military might, but also the complex geopolitical situation in the Near East at the time. Iamani fled to Egypt, Musru, which was in fact ruled by Shabaka, 716-702 BC, and the Nubian 25th dynasty, where he was then turned back over to the Assyrians. It appears that the Nubians under Shabaka were in no mood to incur the wrath of the Assyrian king. Although the rebellious Iamani sojourn in Egypt was short-lived, and Sargon never turned his fury towards the Nile Valley, subsequent kings in both Assyria and Egypt set the stage for a conflict that devastated Egypt and left her temporarily under Assyrian rule. Spallinger contends that the Assyrians never intended to invade Egypt, but due to the Nubian dynasty's meddling in Assyria's affairs in the Levant, they were eventually compelled to act. The first major conflict between Egypt and Assyria took place in the Levant near the city of El Teker in 702-701 BC. The Egyptians were led by the Nubian crown prince Taharka, although the king during the battle was Shebitku, and were allied with the kingdom of Judah against the Assyrian king Sennacherib. Two kings, 19.9 and Isaiah 37.1, both mention that Tirhaka, king of Ethiopia, led a force to help support the Judah king Hezekiah against the Assyrian siege, while an Egyptian source alludes to the crown prince's journey to the Levant. It states, He, Tahaka, came upstream to Thebes in the midst of fine youths. His majesty, King Shebitku, justified, went after them to Nubia. He was with them. He loved him more than all his brothers. He passed by the home of Amen Gempaten, and he worshipped before the door of the temple with the army of his majesty, sailing north together with him. Crown Prince Tahaka then joined Hezekiah and his army against the Assyrians. The confusion in the biblical accounts concerning the correct name of the Egyptian Nubian king can be ascribed to the fact that the existing narrations were drawn up at a date after 690 BC, when it was one of the current facts of life that Tahaka was king of Egypt and Nubia. The Assyrian historical annals give a more detailed account of the battle and its aftermath. The officials, nobles, and people of Ekron, who had thrown Padi, their king, bound by treaty to Assyria, into fetters of iron, and had given him over to Hezekiah the Jew, he kept him in confinement like an enemy. They became afraid, and called upon the Egyptian kings, the bowmen, chariots and horses of the king of Meluha, a countless host, and these came to their aid. In the neighborhood of the city of Altaku, their ranks being drawn up before me, they offered battle. Trusting in the aid of Asur, my lord, I fought with them and brought about their defeat. The Egyptian charioteers and princes, together with the charioteers of the Egyptian king, my hands took alive in the midst of the battle. I besieged el and Timna, conquered them and carried their spoils away. I assaulted Ekron and killed the officials and patricians who had committed the crime and hung their bodies on poles around the city. As to Hezekiah, the Jew, he did not submit to my yoke. I laid siege to forty-six of his strong cities, walled forts, and to the countless small villages in their vicinity. I drove out of them two hundred, one hundred and fifty people. Himself I made a prisoner in Jerusalem, his royal residence, like a bird in a cage. Hezekiah and Judah made a disastrous miscalculation when they decided to rebel against Assyria, but the Egyptian Nubians made an even more fatal mistake because their interference in Assyrian affairs would eventually lead to the collapse of their dynasty. While Sennacherib's war against the Egyptians was the first of its kind, it was short-lived, and he never attempted an actual invasion of Egypt. However, Sennacherib's successor, Esar Haddon, 680-669 BC, took the next logical step and attempted two invasions of Egypt. 
Esar Haddon's attack in 674 was unsuccessful, but he was finally able to conquer Egyptian territory on the edge of the eastern delta in 671 BC. Esar Haddon first made a show of strength at the border of Egypt by conquering Phoenicia and the Levant before setting his sights on Egypt. Assyria's successful invasion of Egypt was commemorated on an alabaster tablet from Ashur that reads, I cut down with the sword and conquered. I caught like a fish and cut off its head. I trod up on Arza at the brook of Egypt. I put Asuhili, its king, in fetters and took him to Assyria. I conquered the town of Bazu in a district which is far away. Upon Kanea, king of Tilmun, I imposed tribute due to me as his lord. I conquered the country of Shupria in its full extent and slew with my own weapon Ik Teshup, its king, who did not listen to my personal orders. I conquered Tyre, which is an island amidst the sea. I took away all the towns and the possessions of Balu, its king, who had put his trust on Tirhaka, king of Nubia. I conquered Egypt, Paturisi, and Nubia. Its king, Tirhaka, I wounded five times with arrow shots and ruled over his entire country. I carried much booty away. All the kings from the islands amidst the sea, from the country Iardana, as far as Tarsisi, bowed to my feet, and I received heavy tribute from them. The details in this particular inscription are historically important because they not only place Tahaka, the ruling Egyptian king, at the scene of the battle, but also claim that he was wounded. Another Assyrian text, known as the Senjiral Stella, offers even more interesting details about the battle. I led siege to Memphis, his royal residence, and conquered it in half a day by means of mines, breaches, and assault ladders. I destroyed it, tore down its walls, and burnt it down. His queen, the women of his palace, Usha Nahuru, his heir apparent, his other children, his possessions, horses, large and small cattle beyond counting, I carried away as booty to Assyria. All Ethiopians I deported from Egypt, leaving not even one to do homage to me. Everywhere in Egypt I appointed new local kings, governors, officers, harbour overseers, officials and administrative personnel. I installed regular sacrificial dues for Ashur and the other great gods, my lords, for all times. I imposed upon them tribute due to me as their overlord, to be paid annually without ceasing. Two important historical points are raised in this inscription. First, it describes the imperial administration that was briefly imposed on Egypt during Assyrian rule, and of the many governors appointed to rule Egypt, one of those, Nekau I, would become the progenitor of the native Egyptian 26th dynasty. The second point is the obvious differentiation that the Assyrians made between the Egyptians and Nubians. This idea, which was proposed by Spallinger, appears to be further substantiated by this text. Also, it is interesting that S. R. Haddon claims that he deported all Nubians from Egypt. At its face value, this part of the text seems extremely inaccurate since there was never any mass deportation of Nubians to other parts of the Assyrian Empire that modern scholars know of, but the truth may be that a number of the ruling class were deported, and possibly held as hostages in Assyria. Although S. R. Haddon's invasion of Egypt resulted in the successful incorporation of the Nile Valley into the Assyrian Empire, his successor invaded Egypt twice more, in order to keep order. Ashurbanipal faced enormous opposition in Egypt from the Nubian elite and thus inflicted the heaviest damage and destruction on Egypt in its history. Modern scholarly knowledge of the two invasions initiated by Ashurbanipal comes from seven Assyrian historical texts, but unfortunately they lack a proper chronological arrangement, according to Spallinger. The so-called Rassam Cylinder, written between 644 and 636 BC, provides modern scholarship with the best recreation of both invasions. Analysis of the Assyrian texts reveals that Ashurbanipal's first invasion was the result of Taharka's attempts to recapture the throne of Egypt, 
while the second invasion was precipitated by rebellious Egyptian vassals who tried to take advantage of the power vacuum caused by the war between the Nubians and Assyrians. Ashur Manipal's first Egyptian campaign, conducted in 669-668 BC, is related in the first part of the Rasam Cylinder. It states, In my first campaign I marched against Magan and Maluha, Tarku, king of Egypt and Ethiopia, whom Esar Haddon, king of Assyria, the father who begot me, had defeated, against the kings, the governors, whom my father had installed in Egypt, he marched, intent on slaying, plundering, and seizing Egypt. He broke in upon them and established himself in Memphis, the city which my father had captured and added to the territory of Assyria. I defeated his army in a battle on the open plain. Tarku heard of the defeat of his armies while in Memphis. He forsook Memphis and fled to save his life to Ni, Thebes. This town too I seized and led my army into it to repose there. Ashur Banipal and the Assyrians' control over Egypt was tenuous at best, and the Nubians kept interfering in the local situation in order to retake the throne, which resulted in one final destructive invasion of Egypt and the sacking of Thebes in 664 BC. Egypt was temporarily under the control of the Nubian king, Tantamani, forcing Ashur Banipal to lead his forces into Egypt in order to reassert Assyrian control over the Nile Valley. The Rassam Cylinder is also the ancient source for Ashur Banipal's second campaign against Egypt, and according to this text, Tantamani was not much of a match for Ashur Banipal. In my second campaign, I made straight for Egypt and Ethiopia. Tandamani heard of the advance of my army, and that I was invading the territory of Egypt. He forsook Memphis and fled to Ni to save his life. The extent of the destruction of Thebes is unknown, especially since the Egyptians were not in the habit of recording their defeats. But one can deduce from previous examples that it was extensive, because the Egyptians were considered a rebellious province. There is a good chance that Ashur Banipal had the sacred statue of the god Amun removed from its home in the Karnak temple and sent to Ashur or Nineveh as previous Assyrian rulers did with the sacred statues of other rebellious peoples, a practice discussed more thoroughly later. Nonetheless, the year 664 was the last time the Assyrians set foot in Egypt. After that year, their power began to wane, and the Egyptian presence in the Near East saw a re-emergence under the native 26th dynasty. Assyria's policy towards Israel, the Levant, and Egypt can be viewed from the perspective of a stronger, more militaristic people who used their might to overpower their weaker foreign neighbors. But its policy towards Babylon was a little more complicated. In the periods when Assyria was strong and Babylon was weak, primarily in the Neo-Assyrian period, the Assyrians were often reluctant to take over the city and surrounding region outright, perhaps because Babylon directly influenced culture and was the older of the two. By 722 BC, Assyria governed Babylon directly. But during the rule of the six major Neo-Assyrian kings, approximately 20 transitions of power took place in Babylon. Sennacherib found Babylon particularly troublesome because he was opposed there by a coalition of Chaldeans, Arameans, native Babylonians, and Elamites in 691 BC. A 15-year siege ensued, which ended in the Assyrian destruction of Babylon. The Assyrian annals read, At the beginning of my kingship, I brought about the overthrow of the Merodach Baladan king of Babylonia together with the armies of Elam in the plain of Kish. In the midst of that battle, he forsook his camp, made his escape alone, fled to Gazumanu, went into the swamps and marshes, and thus saved his life. The chariots, wagons, horses, mules, asses, camels, and Bactrian camels, which he had forsaken at the onset of battle, my hands seized. Into his palace in Babylon I entered joyfully and I opened his treasure house. Gold, silver, vessels of gold and silver, precious stones of all kinds, goods and property, an enormous heavy treasure, his wife, his harem, 
his courtiers and attendants, all his artisans, as many as there were, his palace servants, I brought out, I counted as spoil, I seized. Sennacherib's destruction of Babylon did not permanently destroy the great city. In fact, the Babylonians would later play a role in the destruction of the Assyrian Empire, but it did serve to pacify the city for some time. Esar Hatton generally followed the same policy towards Babylon as his predecessors when he gave his son, Shamash Shuma Ukin, the kingship of Babylon. However, Shamash Shuma Ukin rebelled against his younger brother, Ashur Banipal, who was the king of Assyria in 652. Ashur Banipal had to campaign for several years in order to pacify Babylon once more, which drained the royal coffers and was ultimately part of the Assyrians' own demise. Every empire that has ever existed on the planet has eventually collapsed, and the Assyrian Empire was no exception. The Assyrian Empire witnessed its greatest expansion under Ashurbanipal, but within less than three decades of his death, the mighty empire itself was gone, and Assyria's greatest cities had been destroyed. Even the culture itself was extinguished for the most part. As with the collapse of any empire, internal factors played a role, but the emergence of new kingdoms and the re-emergence of old ones also played critical roles. Ashur Banipal's most noted and impressive campaigns were against Egypt, but Egypt would also have a role in Assyria's undoing. The Nile Valley sat undisturbed for centuries at a time by outside invaders, and even when outsiders did manage to conquer part or even all of Egypt, such as the Hyksos in the 17th century BC, the Libyans at the beginning of the second millennium BC, and the Nubians in the late 8th and early 7th centuries BC, their rule and influence was usually ephemeral. Assyrian rule in Egypt did not last long either, but it proved to be the high watermark of the Assyrian Empire. By the time of Ashurbanipal's death in 627 BC, the Egyptians, under the resurgent 26th dynasty, had managed to take Assyrian Levantine possessions. Despite those conquests, the Egyptian 26th dynasty, which was essentially put into power by Ashurbanipal, maintained cordial relations with the Assyrians and were never a threat to Ashur. Instead, the Assyrians' true threat came from new dynasties to the south and east. To the south of Assyria in Babylon, a new dynasty of ethnic Chaldeans came to power under the rule of Nabopolassar in 626 BC. By 616, Nabopolassar and the Neo-Babylonians, as his dynasty is often referred to by modern scholars, began to raid Assyrian territory and were aided by the Medes, an ethnic group from Iran. Unlike the collapse of many empires, where there are no written texts that describe the events, the fall of Assyria was documented in Neo-Babylonian historical annals. The events are meticulously depicted, taking place in the 10th to 17th years of the reign of Nabopolassar, and a text describes an anti-Assyrian coalition that ultimately destroyed Nineveh and Ashur. The text reads, Twelfth year, when in the month of Abu, the Medians, against Nineveh, they rushed and seized the town of Tarbisu, a town belonging to the province of Nineveh. They went downstream on the embankment of the Tigris and pitched camp against Ashur. They made an attack against the town and took the town. The wall of the town was torn down, a terrible defeat they inflicted upon the entire population. They took booty and carried prisoners away. The king of Akkad and his army, who went to the aid of the Medians, did not come in time for the battle. Thus, ironically, but fittingly, the Assyrians were brutalized in the same ways they had employed by many of the same people that they had previously massacred and enslaved. The passage of time would commit the final act of cruelty on the once great empire. Less than 200 years after the collapse of the Assyrian Empire, the Greek general, mercenary and military historian Xenophon led an expedition of 10,000 Greek soldiers into the Achaemenid Empire to support a rival claimant to the throne. When Xenophon's claimant was killed in battle, he and his men were forced to march through the empire back to Greece. 
On the journey back to Greece, the 10,000 Greeks fought many battles against natives and encountered many awe-inspiring sights. But one of the more inspiring sights that Xenophon wrote about in Anabasis was the ruins of the Assyrian city of Kalhu. Xenophon wrote, After suffering this defeat, the enemy retired, and the Greeks marched on safely for the rest of the day and reached the river Tigris. There was a large deserted city there called Larissa, which in the old days used to be inhabited by the Medes. It had walls twenty-five feet broad and a hundred feet high, with a perimeter of six miles. It was built of bricks made of clay, with the stone base of twenty feet underneath. At the time when the Persians seized the empire from the Medes, the king of the Persians laid siege to the city, but was quite unable to take it. A cloud, however, covered up the sun and hid it from sight until the inhabitants deserted the place, and so the city was taken. Near the city there was a pyramid of stone, a hundred feet broad and two hundred feet high. Many of the natives from the neighboring villages had run away and taken refuge on it. Xenophon's description of the ruins of Kala is important for a few reasons. First, the report is extremely anachronistic, since he credits the Medes as the builders of the city, when in fact they were among the coalition that destroyed it. Second, the ruins of the Pyramid of Stone, he describes, is almost certainly the ziggurat of Kala discussed before, which makes this account the first post-Assyrian text to mention the monument. Perhaps the most noteworthy aspect of Xenophon's account is that the Assyrians, as great as they were in their own time, had been completely forgotten in a matter of just two centuries. It would be many centuries more before historians fully understood the civilization that had once flourished there. Sumerian and Akkadian Origins of Assur What was later to become the great Assyrian Empire arose in approximately 3100 BC from humble origins, as a small city-state centered on Assur, from which they drew their name, contemporary to the Jemdet Nasser and early dynastic periods of southern Mesopotamia. The kingdom of Sargon of Akkad, 2334 to 2279 BC, was located very close to Assur, which was conquered and became an important Akkadian center of governance under the Akkadians. One of the earliest rulers of the city to be identified from the period of Akkadian rule was Ititi, who was described as an overseer, perhaps of the deity Ashur. The same document that identifies him mentions the site of Gasur, also known as Nuzi, modern Yorgan Tepe, an important settlement southeast of Assur, established during a time in which the Akkadians were increasingly focused on expanding their territory into northern Mesopotamia. Even though Sargon the Great was the conqueror, the Assyrians eventually came to define the people of Akkad as being Assyrian and vice versa. And in many ways, Sargon was considered the first Assyrian king. Sargon's empire fell to insurrection and invasion by the hordes of the Guti, a nomadic people based in the Zagros Mountains. After the fall of the Akkadian Empire in the 22nd century BC, Mesopotamia entered a period of chaos and decline, which was eventually brought to an end by King Ur-Namu of the Third Dynasty of Ur, approximately 2112 to 2004 BC. During this time, Assur was a vassal city-state of Ur, a massive city located in southern Mesopotamia close to the Persian Gulf. For approximately 100 years, there was peace and prosperity in the land. Farms prospered and the temples and houses of Assur were rebuilt and new ones erected. During the reign of the renowned third dynasty of Ur king, Amar Sin, 1981-1973 BC, Assur was governed by an individual named Zarikun, who suppressed a rebellion that had sprouted there. While people are familiar with Assyria and the Assyrians, the city's name itself is interesting and a point of scholarly debate because it is also the name of the primary Assyrian god. It is probable that in archaic times, the locals attributed divine attributes to a rocky outcrop named Ashur above the Tigris River, which is where the city then got its name. Whether the god or the city actually came first may never be known for sure, 
but the city developed into a substantial state around the year 2000 BC. From their city, the Assyrians were able to develop far-flung and sophisticated trade networks in the late 3rd and early 2nd millennium BC that would help establish it as a major urban center in the ancient Near East. A number of documents, written in Akkadian cuneiform, were excavated in Anatolia, modern Turkey, and have provided modern scholars with enough information to actually understand and recreate the trade routes and systems used by the Assyrians. For example, the documents show that Assyrian merchants developed trading towns in Anatolia where goods from Mesopotamia and Iran were traded for goods in Anatolia. There were two types of Assyrian trading towns. The Karum, which meant key or harbour in Akkadian, was the primary trading centre of a city, while the Wabatum was a similar trading centre that functioned in a subordinate manner to the nearest Karum. Naturally, the city of Ashur acted as the central point in the trade routes. Tin from Iran and finished textiles from Babylon and southern Mesopotamia traveled through the city to the Karum city of Kanesh in Anatolia. This journey from Ashur to Kanesh lasted about 50 days and was impossible during winter as the passages through the Taurus Mountains were blocked due to ice and snow. The Assyrian merchants carried the tin and textiles on donkeys that they all traded, including the donkeys, when they arrived in Anatolia for silver or gold that they then brought back to Ashur. One of the most interesting aspects of the Assyrian trade network was that it was carried out largely by private entrepreneurs. The Assyrian king was not directly involved, and it's unclear why the Assyrian king did not take a more dominant role in the merchant activities of his people during the old Assyrian period. Scholars have theorized that Assyrian kings might not have wanted to upset a system that worked, or that the kings were not yet powerful enough to influence such intricate networks. The Pantheon of Northern Mesopotamia Archaeologists at Assur have discovered temples, documentary sources full of myths, and bas-reliefs showing rituals, providing a tentative understanding of the cosmological perspectives and religious rituals of the people in the city. The Assyrians spread their worldview like propaganda through the use of monumental architecture, public festivals, and inscriptions describing the power of their king, all of which were desired to inspire awe in the empire subjects. Two of the most important deities in the northern Mesopotamian pantheon, from at least the time of the Sumerians, were Enki and Enlil, the gods of creation and law. Enki was the lord of earth and waters, and was responsible for the creation of humankind. Humans were created out of clay and mud, so that they could serve the gods as their slaves, but the gods also gave humans the ability to grow strong and wise. Enlil was the lord of air, and the rules of reality, and was considered the ruler of the gods. According to the Epic of Gilgamesh, both were important for life on earth to exist, but they were portrayed as being constantly at odds with one another, and for this reason they are said to have represented the notorious duality of chaos, freedom, and order control. Eventually, the gods grew so tired of humanity's rebellious nature that they created a flood with the intention of destroying the human race entirely. Enli warned a chosen few about the flood, and instructed them to build an ark that kept them, various seeds, and many animals from being obliterated. Enki then pleaded with the gods to spare the humans, but it was too late. The floods raged on, and even though humanity seemed to be dead, Enki continued to stress to the other deities the importance of saving the humans. Many of the gods came around to his arguments and realized their mistake, so they were delighted when Enki revealed that he had saved some of the earth's life forms. The tales of Enki and Enlil have a strong connection with all Abrahamic religions, being linked to Yahweh and the Garden of Eden. Much of what the Assyrians and Neo-Assyrians did was in the name of Ashur, the great patron saint of Ashur, whose divine regent was the king. As regent of the gods on earth, the king of Assyria was divinely sanctioned to wage war. Ashur brought prosperity to the Assyrians as long as conquests continued. If their conquests ever stopped, then the world would end, 
and for this reason, later Assyrian kings would engage in annual military campaigns against their neighbors. In the 7th century CE, the Neo-Assyrian king, Esarhaddon, wrote, Ashur, father of the gods, empowered me to depopulate and repopulate, to make broad the boundary of the land of Assyria. Many other deities were worshipped in Assur before and during the Assyrian period. The Assyrian manifestation of Ishtar was later called Ishtar Ashuritu, worshipped there from at least the early dynastic period. As the goddess of battles, Ishtar was particularly revered by the warlike Assyrians. Sacrifices and prayers were sent to her before their campaigns. One such example expressed, O though heroine among the gods, like a bundle, rip him open in the midst of battle. Rise up against him, a tempest, an evil wind. Cuneiform inscriptions at the cult center of Kar to Kulti Ninurta indicate that Nusku, the deity of light, was worshipped there daily by the king during the Middle Assyrian period. Others included Ninurta, the warlike god of nature, Shamash was the sun god and supreme judge, the moon god Sin, and Adad, god of the storms. One of the latest deities to be worshipped at Assur was Nabu. Their temple was constructed in the late 7th century BC. The earliest layout of the city, dating from the Sumerian and Akkadian periods, remains shrouded in mystery. Some have identified the site as Arbasal, a city described in early documentary accounts of trade between northern Syria and the upper Tigris, though in all likelihood this is wrong. Instead, it's more likely the city was named through its association with Ashur from as early as the 3rd millennium BC. The earliest archaeological traces from Ashur that have been accurately dated are from 2500 BC, with documentary sources from as early as approximately 2300 BC. The city covered an area of approximately 70 hectares, an area that was peopled by kings, nobles, merchants, craftsmen, artists, scholars, farmers, and slaves. It can be divided into two broad areas. The north is the old city, Libi Ali, city center, the largest part of the city, and that which contained the most important structures. The new city, Alu Eshu, was constructed during the middle of the second millennium BC. Access to the old city was from the west during the later periods of occupation via a series of heavily fortified gates. The ancient temple of Ashur was one of the earliest and most important structures in the city, built sometime between 2900 and 2600 BC. It was located at the highest point of the rock upon which Ashur was situated. Known also as Eshara, or the Temple of the Universe, this complex was dedicated to Ashur, the patron deity of the settlement, whose stature in Assyrian society grew as the city flourished. Some fine artifacts dating from the earliest periods of occupation have been discovered here, including a small stone vase decorated in high-relief designs. The temple of Ashur was modified and added to under the reigns of successive Assyrian kings. To the west of the temple of Ashur was the ziggurat. This was a monumental temple built out of adobe bricks, which reached a height of 30 meters. This structure was initially dedicated to Enlil, and then later to Ashur. The priests of these temples would have had much power being able to communicate directly with the gods. In the temple at the top of the pyramid, kings and high priests made offerings and prayed for a good harvest. Any individual that was able to lead rituals to placate the impulsive gods were highly valued, and for this reason, later Assyrian kings would begin to portray themselves as priestly figures. It is also believed that ziggurats, such as this, could have been used as places of shelter when the river Tigris flooded. In the Old Testament, it is written that people and their livestock fled from the floodwaters into just such a building. The Temple of Ishtar was located at the center of the city. Its origins lie sometime between 2500 and 2334 BC. This structure was built, demolished, and rebuilt many times over the millennia. Eight layers of temple foundations were recorded by archaeologists in the early 20th century, each being excavated, documented, and photographed or drawn before being destroyed to uncover the parts below. The earliest five layers were labeled the archaic temples, 
as no inscriptions were found that could reveal the names of the kings that ordered these structures to be built. These archaic levels date from between the early dynastic period and the middle Assyrian period. Sumerian and Akkadian styles of art and architecture from southern Mesopotamia are seen throughout the city. The Akkadian heartland was in southern Mesopotamia, but their dominance in the city is indicated by the presence of monumental royal statues discovered in the Ishtar temple. One particularly well-preserved statue made of diorite and dating from the late 3rd or early 2nd millennium BC shares the dorm and decorative style of works commonly found in southern Mesopotamia and Elam. The complex was approximately 120 square meters large. Access was from the west via a small forum, which led into a long corridor that opened into a main central courtyard. East of this was the so-called cult room, a long rectangular space with clay benches on three of the walls. To the north was a room that served as a cellar, with a squat podium at one end. A great number of interesting artifacts have been recovered here, including offering stands, clay fragments of altars, and stands which may have been used to burn incense or place offerings, which together indicate the ceremonial function of this complex. Ceramic vessels decorated with high-relief human figures and animals, likely lions and bulls, and carved stone figurines were also discovered there and dated to the Sumerian period of occupation. The most interesting finds from the Ishtar temple were the house-shaped altars dating from the same time. These were in the form of a two-story building, the front faces covered in windows. Impressions of contemporary cylinder seals show how these would have been used, with offerings and incense burners placed on top. The buildings of Asur remained in continuous use for extended periods of time, and thus went through normal phases of disrepair and erosion in the harsh North Mesopotamian climate. Therefore, they frequently required restoration and reconstruction, tasks that were undertaken under the orders of the reigning kings, who would record their prestigious acts and those of their forebears in order to portray their power and prestige. For example, many of the foundation documents left behind by Adad Nirari I are careful to pay homage to the public structures built and maintained by his predecessors before detailing the importance and extent of his own contribution. The Old Assyrian Period After a century, the Third Dynasty of Ur was shattered by the invasion of the nomadic Amorites, also known as the Semites. This initiated a period of turbulence as several city-states vied for supremacy across the region. In the wake of the collapse of the Third Dynasty of Ur, Assur managed to establish its independence. The early centuries of the second millennium are known as the Old Assyrian Period, a time in which the earliest documented kings of Assyria ruled. One of the earliest and most important rulers named in the Assyrian king list, a genealogy composed of information from a number of documentary sources, was Shamshi Adad I, approximately 1815 to 1782 BC. The Assyrians recognized Shamsi Adad as their first king, but interestingly, they also recognized his Babylonian origin. Shamsi Adad, the son of Ilu Kabkabi, went away to Babylonia in the time of Naram Sin. In the eponymy of Ibn Adad, Shamsi Adad came back from Babylonia. He seized Ekelate. He stayed in Ekelate for three years. In the eponymy of Atamar Ishtar, Shamsi Adad came up from Ekelate and removed Erishu, son of Naramsin, from the throne. Inscriptions from the reign of Shamsi Adad demonstrate that although he was not from Ashur, he gave praise to the god Ashur and beautified the city. One inscription read, Shamsi Adad, king of the universe, builder of the temple of Asur, who devotes his energies to the land between the Tigris and Euphrates. At the command of Asur, who loves him, he whose name Anu and Enlil had name for great deeds, above the kings who had gone before the temple of Enlil, which Erishum, son of Ilushuma, had built, and whose structure had fallen to ruins. The temple of Enlil, my lord, a magnificent shrine, a spacious abode, 
the dwelling of Enlil my lord, which had been planned according to the plan of wise architects in my city Assur. I roofed that temple with cedars. In the doors I placed door leaves of cedar, covered with silver and gold. The walls of that temple, laid upon silver, gold, lapis lazuli, and sandu stone, with cedar oil, choice oil, honey and butter, I sprinkled the mud walls. This passage also demonstrates another precedent that Shamsi Adad would set for later Assyrian kings, the use of the epithet ruler of the universe. Shamsi Adad I was forced to defend the Assyrian frontiers from its neighbors to the north and south. During this incessant conflict, the Assyrians developed armies of battle-hardened warriors. With these soldiers, the city-state solidified into a stable and powerful organization, unlike the fragile and frequently overthrown settlements that existed elsewhere in Mesopotamia. In many ways, it was the military ethos forged during this time and preserved over centuries that made the Assyrians different. They were fierce hunters, being attributed as having been responsible for the extinction of the Mesopotamian lion. One later Assyrian king was said to have been responsible for killing 340 lions, 120 elephants, and countless other beasts. However, it is important to note that the old and succeeding Middle Assyrian armies were only peasant armies. There was no such thing as a professional standing army in the world at this time. These warriors were forced to return to their homes each year to fulfill their agricultural commitments during the winter months, which limited the extent to which the Assyrian kings could engage in military campaigns, a problem that would carry on long into the Neo-Assyrian Empire as well. With this military power, a territorial state began to take form, with Assur as the central place of governance. The Assyrian city-state was similar to their predecessors, but different in a number of important ways. Early proto-socialism was replaced by an early form of private enterprise, by which people could produce or acquire as many resources as they liked, as long as they paid a tax to the central government. Taxation became incredibly important in the creation of a stable social order, as vassal states would send tribute to the Assyrian king. In doing so, they created one of the earliest examples of the important and durable forms of political organization in world history, the empire. The characteristic elements of empires were not invented by the Persians or Romans, but had been developed and refined long before these great powers by the Assyrians. They demonstrated a desire for a unified world, an economy based on taxes and tithes from vassal states, which also entailed allowing local customs and systems of rule to continue as long as the Assyrian dominance was acknowledged. The problem with such empires is that they were diverse and multi-ethnic, which has historically made them difficult to unify, let alone maintain, over long periods of time. Around the time of the rise of the Assyrian Empire, the responsibility of the well-being and social order of the city-state's population shifted from goods to people, as great palaces for royal elites emerged in cities across the region. These kings, most of whom were successful military leaders or rich landowners, took on a quasi-religious role, portraying themselves as regents or deputies representing the wishes of the gods. They recorded their role in society through public inscriptions in the cuneiform script, which became adopted to record a wide range of quotidian transactions. Socially stratified class distinctions emerged between the royalty, priests, and commoners, and written languages played an important role in widening the gap between these classes. Assur served as the political, religious, and cultural heart of the old Assyrian Empire. Most of the structures erected during the Sumerian and Akkadian periods continue to be used, and many new building complexes were constructed. The rulers of the old Assyrian Empire did not reside exclusively within Assur. For example, Shamshi Ardad had a palace in Shubat Enlil, the home of Enlil, also known as Shechna. Despite its distance from Assur, he involved himself in building projects in the city and even embarked on military campaigns to the Levant in order to acquire timber for the restoration of the Temple of Ashur. 
The most notable addition to the city during this time was the Old Palace, a 10,500 square meter complex located adjacent to the ziggurat. This was the primary residence of the Assyrian royalty and served as the focal point of administration and trade in the city. 24 Assyrian kings of the Old, Middle and Neo-Assyrian periods contributed to its development by restoring, enlarging and rebuilding its parts during their reigns. Its origins lie in the Old Assyrian period and it was finally abandoned in the wake of the destruction of the city by the Medes in 614 BC. Little is known of the original ground plan, the construction of which is generally attributed to King Shamshi Adad I. In fact, the only real evidence we have of its existence, archaeological or documentary, is a reference to its destruction by Puzur Sin, a vice-regent in the city between 1639 and 1628 BC. On the command of the god Ashur, my lord, I destroyed the buildings he worked on, the city wall and the palace of Shamshi Adad. More information is known about the Middle Assyrian period of the building's layout and uses, though one could infer a similar ground plan having existed at an earlier phase. It was composed of a central courtyard which gave way to four palatial wings to the northeast, southwest and east. The main entrance to the palace was from its northwestern wing. The throne room, called the Bit Labuni, was situated within the southwestern wing, and the Ekal Kaki, Palace of Weapons, was located in an annex affixed to the northwestern wing. The palace was furnished with wall slabs carved with bas reliefs and sculptures made of basalt and limestone. One particularly interesting feature discovered by archaeologists close to the later Sin and Shamash temple was a burial dating from the old Assyrian period. This has been interpreted as being the grave of a wealthy merchant that lived in the city. Little remains of the skeletons and the grave itself is unremarkable, being nothing more than a simple rectangular hole cut into the earth. The significance of this burial instead lies in the huge amounts and quality of the grave goods buried alongside the individual, including a variety of ceramic objects, copper lance points, vessels and daggers, and gold jewelry such as diadems, beaded necklaces, earrings and foot rings. Other jewelry was made of silver, lapis lazuli, agate and other semi-precious stones. This veritable hoard of treasures also contained an ostrich egg and small figurines of gazelles that are believed to have been used during burial rites. Beyond the immediate associations of this wealth with the individual buried in the same context, this hoard indicates the role of Assur in wider networks of contact and trade throughout the region. The inventory of objects contains materials that are not native to northern Mesopotamia which indicates that mercantile links were being made between Assur and southern Mesopotamia, Anatolia and Afghanistan during this period, or even earlier. The objects may have already been quite old before being placed within the grave. After the death of Shamshi Adad I, he was succeeded by his son Ishmed Dagan, 1782 to 1742 BC. But under his rule, the old Assyrian Empire fell into decay, with Assur existing as just one of many city-states that were vying for power in the area. A veritable Dark Age followed, between approximately 1700 and 1365 BC, during which time Assur became dominated by Babylon. Shamshi Adad I was a contemporary of King Hammurabi, one of the most famous of the ancient Mesopotamian monarchs. Hammurabi ruled the relatively new kingdom of Babylon from 1792 to 1750 BC and captured Assur in approximately 1759 BC. One of his most influential legacies was the law code that he enforced throughout his territories, which established everything from the wages of ox drivers to the punishment of taking an eye, being to have one's own eye taken, a principle that was later repeated in the Law of Moses. Through the law codes, Hammurabi tried to portray himself in two roles, a shepherd that brings peace and a benevolent father, and such an image became shared by the Assyrian leaders. The Middle Assyrian Period In the 15th century BC, tribes of the Indo-European Mitanni came to the land, led by their king Shosh Tatar. 
The Mitanni captured Assur from the Babylonians and turned the city into a vassal of their large empire. However, the Mitanni state eventually became weakened and collapsed after the invasions of the Hittites from Anatolia in the 1300s BC, enabling the Assyrians to throw off their yoke and become independent again. The overthrow of the Mitanni kings by Iriba Adad I, 1382 to 1356 BC, and his son, Ashur Ubalit I, marked the next phase in the history of Assur, the Middle Assyrian Empire. Ashur Ubalit I established a dynasty of priest kings that ruled over the city state for the next four centuries. Spurred by their successes against the Hittites in the north, the Assyrians embarked on a series of military campaigns that expanded their empire across an area stretching from Karchemish on the Euphrates to Hanig Albat and Babylonia to the Balik and Habu river valleys. Babylon itself was conquered by King Tukulti Ninurta I, 1243 to 1207 BC, at which point the Assyrian ruler began to identify himself as King of the Universe. Despite the environmental problems and threats caused by their migration into northern Syria under the reign of Tiglath Pileser I, the empire swelled once again. In a prayer, he praised Ashur as follows, Ashur and the great gods who have enlarged my kingdom, who have given me strength and power, as my portion commanded me to extend the territory of their country, putting into my hand their powerful weapons, the cyclone of battle. I have subjugated lands and mountains, cities and their rulers, enemies of Ashur, and conquered their territories. The Assyrians experienced a golden age under the rule of the successors of Tukulti Ninuta I. There was no other power in the region that could rival them, other than the growth of the Arameans. Tukulti Ninuta constructed a cult center and his palace in Kar Tukulti Ninuta, located a short distance northeast from Assur, in which he was eventually assassinated by his son. Considered as an extension to Assur by present-day scholars, this site contains some of the best preserved examples of Assyrian wall paintings that were discovered as fragments by archaeologists in the 1910s, but which have since been extensively studied and reconstructed. The general form of these paintings was of a monochrome red background, the long black stripes along the base above which various images were painted, geometric motifs, naturalistic patterns, stylized sacred trees, animals and figures. The paintings from the north side of the palace differed in that they had polychromatic backgrounds and images painted in exquisite detail. Scholars have analyzed the pigments used at Ka Tukulti Ninuta, many of which were likely required to have been imported, which contributes to the general picture of Assur's role as a key node of trade and interaction in wider Eurasia. The Middle Assyrian king Adad Nirari I, 1305-1274 BC, was evidently one of the most tireless and active builders in the history of Assyria. He oversaw the restoration of the Ishtar Temple, the rebuilding of the Temple of Ashur, the reconstruction of the Old Palace, the erection of city walls and gates, and the modification of the ziggurat of Ashur. Thanks to the numerous foundation documents that he left behind, no fewer than 58 stone slabs, 12 clay tablets, and 170 inscribed bricks, more is known about his life and construction projects than any preceding ruler. It was during this time that temples devoted to numerous other deities were constructed in the city. A temple complex devoted to both Sin, god of the moon, and Shamash, god of the sun, was established in the northern part of the city, though little remains of this structure in the present day. A second double temple was constructed during the second millennium, this one being dedicated to the deities, Anu, king of the gods and the sky, and Adad, god of the storms. This complex featured two tower-like ziggurats flanking a central courtyard. The Ishtar temple was used as a place of burial during the Middle Assyrian period. A very well-preserved tomb was discovered in 1908 by German archaeologists at the southwestern corner of the temple complex and was found to have been sealed and untouched since the time of its original use. At the end of the year, the tomb was opened. 
What they experienced was akin to what Howard Carter found when he opened Tutankhamun's tomb in 1923. The contents of the vaulted brick chamber were undisturbed, the skeletal remains intact, and no immediate evidence of a curse. Known today as Tomb 45, this tomb has served as an excellent time capsule from a particular point in time, the terminus ante quiem being when the chamber was sealed sometime during the 14th century BC. The presence of multiple bodies, most of them female, indicates that it was used over a great length of time before this point. It contained a collection of clay tablets, the complete library of a man named Babu Aha Idina. Archaeological evidence suggests that the tomb would have been located beneath a house, perhaps the home of Babu Aha Idina and his family, who were likely the figures interred there. Buried alongside the figures was a large inventory of grave goods, alabaster jars, ivory combs, lapis lazuli cylinder seals, rings, pendants and necklaces made of gold and semi-precious stones, and a large quantity of ceramic vessels. One exceptional object was found in this tomb, an inscribed cylindrical pyxis, a vessel with a lid that swiveled horizontally, made of elephant tusk. The container was exquisitely decorated with naturalistic motifs and animals. Both the form and material indicate that connections existed between Assur and the Levant and Egypt during this period. Yet, unlike the violent and chaotic scenes of nature used in these regions, the decorative scheme of the vessel from Assur is distinctly peaceful and harmonious. Also found in the tomb was a similarly decorated inscribed ivory comb. Together, these form the earliest examples of a fully developed Assyrian artistic style from the 14th century. This was a time of intensive trade and communication between Assyria and its neighbors, known as the Amarna period, when fashions and artistic styles were changing across the region. Archaeologists have discovered more than 140 monumental stone stelae in various sizes in the new city, located to the south of the Libi Ali. These were dedicated to the Assyrian royalty and city officials. It is believed that these were originally located within or close to the Temple of Ashur, but were moved to this location during the Middle Assyrian period. They have served as a vital source of information regarding the city's chronology and the genealogy of the Assyrian rulers. As a result of the assassination of Tukulti Ninurta I, his successors faced frequent dissent and conflict over the legitimacy of their power, and the empire even devolved into civil war at times. Babylonia rose in rebellion, and the empire faced a number of conflicts in their northern and western territories, and also to the south against the Elamites in 1160 BC. Alongside these political events, there was a general social decline evident in the material record, and few new documents, works of art and architecture, and evidence of famine and crop failures in the Assyrian heartland. The late second millennium BC was a period of unrest in the Near East, especially as the Bronze Age was swept away and replaced by the Iron Age. The transition to the Iron Age proved to be especially violent, and it brought about the end of the Great Powers Club, a mysterious coalition of warrior tribes, known collectively as the Sea Peoples, ravaged the coastal kingdoms of the eastern Mediterranean, and they destroyed the kingdoms of Ugarit and Hatti, and nearly destroyed Egypt as well. Since they were located further inland from the Mediterranean coast, the Assyrians did not suffer as much from the Sea Peoples' attacks, but the empire was not totally immune to the general situation either. A group of Semitic-speaking people, known as the Arameans, began to attack and ravage numerous Mesopotamian cities around this same time. The Aramean raids became the primary focus of tiglat pileser's reign, a fact mentioned in the historical annals. With the help of Assur, my lord, I led forth my chariots and warriors, and went into the desert, into the midst of the Alami, Arameans, enemies of Assur, my lord, I marched the country from Suhi to the city of Karchemish, in the land of Hatti, I raided in one day. I slew their troops, their spoil, their goods, and their possessions in countless numbers I carried away. 
the rest of their forces, which had fled from before the terrible weapons of Assur, my lord, and had crossed over the Euphrates, in pursuit of them I crossed the Euphrates in vessels made of skins. Six of their cities, which lay at the foot of the mountain of Beshri, I captured, I burned with fire, I laid them waste, I destroyed them. Their spoil, their goods, and their possessions I carried away to my city Assur. However, despite Tiglath Pileser's best efforts, the Aramean hordes eventually reduced the Assyrian Empire to its original heartland around Ashur by 1050 BC. The Arameans and the general collapse of the period may have reduced the land the Assyrians held, but Robert Druse has argued that the use of infantry helped them survive the collapse, whereas others, such as the Hittites, did not. The historian's History of the World described Assyrian infantry. The spear of the Assyrian footman was short, scarcely exceeding the height of a man. That of the horseman appears to have been considerably longer. The shaft was probably of some strong wood, and did not consist of a reed, like that of the modern Arab lance. It will probably never be definitively determined how and why the Assyrians survived the collapse of the Bronze Age, but Drew's argument brings to light an important aspect of Assyrian culture that would define them in their golden age, their military prowess. The Neo-Assyrian Period The rich and fertile plains of northern Iraq, so inviting to be tilled, also beckoned to be plundered. A typical Assyrian needed in one hand his plowshare and in the other a sword. By 1000 BC, Assyria, long a vassal to the Arameans and various other city-states, had tired of foreign oppression. From approximately 900 BC, Assur regained its prominence as a political, religious, and cultural center with the rise of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. The Chaldeans were a particularly strong influence by the 920s, arriving at the same time as the Arameans after the late Bronze Age collapse. The Chaldeans initially occupied Babylonia and the marshlands in southern Mesopotamia close to the Persian Gulf, but from this area expanded northwards into northern Iraq. By this time, the early Neo-Assyrian king Ashur Dan II had been engaging in annual campaigns against the tribes of Nairi around Lake Van, Cimmerians, Scythians, Arameans, and Neo-Hittites to the north, northeast, and northwest all in honor of Ashur. In 912 BC, Ashur Dan II died, and his son, Adad Nirari II, came to power the following year after a brief civil war. Until his reign ended in 891 BC, Adad Nirari II went to war every year. Indeed, there is no record indicating that he did not go to war at any point. In 910, he campaigned against the Arameans, winning a decisive battle at the junction of the Kabur and Euphrates. This marked the first time since the Middle Assyrian era in which Assyria actively expanded their territory. The campaigns Ashur Dan II had engaged in sought to defeat foes, not gain new land. Between 907 and 902 BC, Adad Nirari II campaigned deep into the Aramean heartland, eventually conquering the Suku Arameans who henceforth paid tribute to Assur and later Babylon. Beginning around 911 BC, the Neo-Assyrian Empire grew from its homeland around Assur to include the whole of Mesopotamia, the eastern coast of the Mediterranean, and by 680 BC, even Egypt. Such expansion was thanks to the most brutal, terrifying, and efficient army that the world had ever seen. Assyria began to enlarge its borders, but with each change of seasons, the empire withered. When autumn came, the soldiers returned to their fields. It was during these times that rebellion started, and the empire would shrink once again. In 746 BC, there was a great revolt in Kala, located between Nineveh and Assur, which had been the capital of the Assyrian empire since the reign of Ashurbanipal II in 879 BC. Moreover, a plague was ravaging the Assyrian homeland during this time, and during the revolt, Ashur Nirari V died without an heir. The last of an extremely long-lasting Neo-Assyrian dynasty, the Agasid, 
which began with King Bel Bami in 1700 BC. The governor of Kala, Pulu, managed to win the civil war and defeat the rebels, and then, claiming to be the son of Adad Nirari III, a pedigree that most scholars believe was false, he took power of Assyria and assumed the name of Tiglath Pileser III. His campaigns between 745 and 740 BC and reforms transformed the empire completely, bringing back many old policies. Deportations frequently occurred of up to 200,000 people to Assyria's contested borders. Eunuchs were installed as governors to prevent rival dynasties. Vassal states were turned into provinces ruled by Assyrians, and the power of the semi-independent Assyrian nobility was restrained with a dual-position-based administration. Tiglath Pileser III vowed to make Assyria forever strong with its first standing army. Encouraged by the prospects of a career at arms, thousands of young men enlisted. He created all of the institutions these soldiers would need and left behind extensive documentary evidence of what this entailed, which provide a unique perspective into the Neo-Assyrian military structure. Tiglath Pileser III had introduced for the first time a standing army that never demobilized during the winter, allowing the range of his campaigns to increase substantially. His campaigns across Babylonia, the kingdoms of the Zagros Mountains to the east and Syria to the west, were particularly bloody and successful, resulting in an empire whose borders stretched to a greater extent than had ever existed. His army was a meritocracy. Generals weren't chosen based on their family connections, but based on their skill at military command. Hundreds of thousands of people were deported from their homelands by the Neo-Assyrian conquerors, separating them from their histories and their families. In a similar fashion, skilled workers were sent across the empire to where they were needed most. Iron and bronze were the backbone of the Assyrian army. Each soldier was issued a conical iron helmet, a sturdy breastplate of interlocking strips of bronze, and strong leather boots. The tallest men served as spear carriers, wielding an iron-tipped lance, but were also armed with a dagger for close-quarters combat. Some soldiers became archers, and some carried no weapons at all. Their role was to protect other warriors giving cover to the archers, with shields four feet high that were made of leather and faced with beaten bronze or plated with wickerwork. Well equipped as these foot soldiers were, the Assyrians sought even greater advantages against their foes. Horses were acquired for their chariots and iron for their weapons. So important were they that the Assyrians avoided shooting horses during battle. Timber was required for boats and siege engines. To get these commodities, the Assyrians campaigned farther and farther afield and brought the spoils of victory back to their homeland. Of course, living off the land meant that the great Assyrian armies were limited in how far they could travel. It was for this reason that the king set up huge granaries throughout the empire, ensuring that his troops could campaign up to 300 miles from a base of supplies. Like the Egyptians, the Assyrians had improved upon the clumsy four-wheeled chariots of Babylonia. Amassing their two-wheeled chariots like shock troops, they could break through an enemy's line and shower them with arrows and spears. These were followed by another innovative class of soldier, the mounted archers. These consisted of two men riding two horses, one steering the animals and holding a shield, while the other used his bow. Whoever fled was run down, and whoever remained was slaughtered. The king rode at the front of his army, among his cavalry and chariots, followed by his infantry. Behind them all snaked a long supply train, where craftsmen made weapons and armor as they rode. At the festival of the New Year, the king inspected his army to ensure that it was always ready to fight. Fed, clothed, and armed at his expense, the Assyrian warriors became the most professional army that the world had ever seen. At the outset, the Assyrians enjoyed an advantage possessed by few enemies, mobility. They would travel along good roads maintained by the shovels of prisoners of war. On flat land, they could advance 20 miles each day. By surmounting natural obstacles, especially rivers, the Assyrians reached new heights of ingenuity. Their chariots and siege engines were carried in large boats, with their horses swimming behind, while the troops traveled on inflated animal skins. Back in Assur, 
the Alu Eshu, new city, expanded greatly to the south during the Neo-Assyrian period. Many substantially sized buildings were constructed there, including stables and arsenals for the Neo-Assyrian standing army, and storehouses for their trading caravans and tax income. A large new structure surrounded by an expansive garden was built outside of the city walls by King Senasherib. This was the Akitu Temple, where the annual New Year's festival was celebrated. The doors of the temple were allegedly decorated with battle scenes of the defeat of Kingu, the Babylonian god that was slain by Marduk. Senasherib also constructed a New Year's festival house and processional avenue on the relatively flat plain to the northwest of the city. A temple to the divine couple, Nabu, god of wisdom and son of Ashur, and his consort, Taslumitam, the lady who listens, was constructed in the 8th century at the site of the Ishtar temple. The Neo-Assyrian kings actively restored the main sanctuaries and structures of the city, though in the 680s, Sennacherib modified some of the religious sites, such as the Temple of Ashur, to accord with his reinterpretations of state theology. Towards the end of the second millennium BC, the residential and administrative functions of the old palace appear to have transferred to the so-called New Palace, located in the western part of the Libby Ali. This started under the reign of Tukulti Ninurta I, but was completed by Ashur Nasipal II, the grandson of Adad Nirari II and one of the greatest kings of Neo-Assyria. Ashur Nasipal II reused building materials and decorative sculptures from the old palace to build this new structure, which resulted in less than one quarter of the old palace structure surviving into the Neo-Assyrian period. The new palace was decorated with carved wall slabs and Lamassu bull statues, images of kingship and royal strength that were popular in the Babylonian cities. Under the rule of Shalmaneser III, 858 to 824 BC, the Libby Ali was enclosed by a massive double wall, complete with a deep moat. Access to and from the city center was controlled through three gates, the South Gate, West Gate, and Tabira Gate. Most of the materials that he used to construct these fortifications came from the pre-existing Old and Middle Assyrian buildings, especially the ruinous old palace. While northern Mesopotamia was fertile, it lacked almost all other important resources. Metal for tools, stone for sculpture, wood for construction and burning, all had to be traded for from neighboring lands, and indeed long-distance trade from Assur appears to have started during the third dynasty of Ur period. Merchants from the city established permanent mercantile colonies in Anatolia, known as Karams, where they were involved in the east-west trade of textiles, tin and silver. The best preserved of these was at Karam Kanesh. Although the Zagros mountain range separated Assur from the lands farther east, these mighty mountains did not act as absolute boundaries, rather zones of integration and fragmentation. Trading caravans embarked from Assur across the mountains to destinations as far as Afghanistan, the Arabian Peninsula, and even the Indus River Valley. The Assyrians sought a number of important commodities from these lands, foremost of which were iron, stone, wood, precious metals, and semi-precious stones. An inscription dating from the 20th century BC, discovered at the Temple of Ishtar, identifies the city as being involved in the trade of copper between northern and southern Mesopotamia and even further afield to the region of present-day Oman. Elephants existed in Mesopotamia until approximately the 8th century BC, though ivory was also imported from North Africa and the Indus River Valley. In return, the Assyrian merchants brought much wealth most of it plundered from their military campaigns or crafted in the workshops of Assur and Nineveh. One of the most important exports from Assur would have been glass products, faience and glazes of various types and colors. The region has a long history of glass production dating from at least the Sumerian Akkadian period. The city was ideally situated to make use of the abundant supply of silica, sodium oxide and lime available in the landscape. A vast inventory of glass beakers, urns, 
flasks, lidded jars, and mosaic tiles has been recovered from the tombs and burials of Assur, most of them clearly displaying the tool marks left behind by the hands of Assyrian craftsmen thousands of years ago. The strategic location of the city meant that the Assyrian rulers could monitor the traffic and trade that moved along the Tigris River Valley. By the beginning of the second millennium BC, grave goods recovered from burial tombs at the old palace site indicate the complexity and scale of the trading network Assur was part of. By the 14th century BC, the connections forged by this trade had resulted in a remarkable fusion of cultures in the city, with artistic and architectural elements from Egypt, Anatolia, southern Mesopotamia, Syria, and the northern Mediterranean, all found in the city. The Neo-Assyrians have a deserved reputation for being the brutal bullies of ancient Mesopotamia, and their wrath was fully on display under the rule of one of Assyria's most important leaders during the period, Sargon II, 721-705 BC, who restructured the Assyrian state internally, conducted military campaigns almost every year, and incorporated the conquered territories into provinces. In fact, one of the most notable changes he made to the Assyrian system was to increase the number of provinces from 12 to 25, which decreased the power of the provincial governors. One of the most important provinces within the Assyrian Empire was Samaria. Also known as Israel, Samaria repeatedly rebelled against their Assyrian overlords, but in 722 the Assyrians overran Samaria once and for all, killing countless numbers and sending most of the rest of its inhabitants into forced exile. The events of Samaria's fall were chronicled in the Assyrian annals from the reign of Sargon II and the Old Testament, and although the two sources present the event from different perspectives, they corroborate each other for the most part, and together present a reliable account of the situation. The Assyrian record reads, I besieged and conquered Samaria, led away as booty 27,290 inhabitants of it. I formed from among them a contingent of fifty chariots, and made remaining inhabitants assume their social positions. I installed over them an officer of mine, and imposed upon them the tribute of the former king. Hanno, king of Gaza, and also Sibeh, the Turton of Egypt, Musuri, set out from Rapihu against me to deliver a decisive battle. I defeated them. Sibir ran away, afraid when he only heard the noise of my approaching army, and has not been seen again. Hanno I captured personally. I received tribute from Piru of Musuru, from Samsi, Queen of Arabia, and Itamar, the Sabaean, gold in dust form, horses and camels. The Assyrian account reveals that others in the region, namely the Egyptians, were involved on Israel's side to a certain extent but it is uncertain how many troops were sent with Sibe, because this account cannot be corroborated by any Egyptian source. Perhaps the most striking piece of information is that nearly 30,000 Israelites were removed from the region. The forced removal of rebellious populations by the Assyrians was a brutal but effective tactic that they commonly used. The biblical account of the fall of Samaria is quite similar to the Assyrian, but with a few minor differences. The account states, And it came to pass in the fourth year of King Hezekiah, which was the seventh year of Hoshea, a son of Elah, king of Israel, that Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against Samaria and besieged it. And at the end of three years they took it. Even in the sixth year of Hezekiah, that is the ninth year of Hoshea, king of Israel, Samaria was taken and the king of Assyria did carry away Israel unto Assyria, and put them in Hala, and in Habor by the river of Gozan, and in the city of the Medes. The Assyrian siege and destruction of Samaria seemed to set into motion a chain of events of similarly brutal sieges that the Assyrian war machine meted out to rebellious provinces, and any others who stood in its way in the late 8th and early 7th centuries B.C. A few years after he destroyed Israel, Sargon turned his attention to one of Samaria's neighbors, the coastal city of Ashdod. According to the annals from the Assyrian king of Khorsabad, Iamani, 
the king of Ashdod decided to abandon his subordinate status to Assyria in favor of Egypt, which was ruled by the Nubians at the time. The text states, Iamani from Ashdod, afraid of my armed force, left his wife and children and fled to the frontier of Musru, which belongs to Meluha, and hid there like a thief. I installed an officer of mine as governor over his entire large country and its prosperous inhabitants, thus aggrandizing again the territory belonging to Ashur, the king of the gods. The terror-inspiring glamour of Ashur, my lord, overpowered, however, the king of Meluha, and he threw him, that is, Iamani, in fetters on hands and feet, and sent him to me to Assyria. I conquered and sacked the towns, Shinutu and Samaria, and all Israel. I caught, like a fish, the Greek Ionians who live on islands amidst the western sea. At first, this text appears somewhat confusing, but a closer examination reveals not only the Assyrians' military might, but also the complex geopolitical situation in the Near East at the time. Iamani fled to Egypt, Musru, which was in fact ruled by Shabaka, 716-702 BC, and the Nubian 25th dynasty, where he was then turned back over to the Assyrians. It appears that the Nubians under Shabaka were in no mood to incur the wrath of the Assyrian king. Although the rebellious Iamani sojourn in Egypt was short-lived, and Sargon never turned his fury towards the Nile Valley, subsequent kings in both Assyria and Egypt set the stage for a conflict that devastated Egypt and left her temporarily under Assyrian rule. Spallinger contends that the Assyrians never intended to invade Egypt, but due to the Nubian dynasty's meddling in Assyria's affairs in the Levant, they were eventually compelled to act. The first major conflict between Egypt and Assyria took place in the Levant near the city of El Teker in 702-701 BC. The Egyptians were led by the Nubian crown prince, Taharka, although the king during the battle was Shebitku, and were allied with the kingdom of Judah against the Assyrian king, Sennacherib. Two kings, 19.9 and Isaiah 37.1, both mention that Tirhaka, king of Ethiopia, led a force to help support the Judah king, Hezekiah, against the Assyrian siege, while an Egyptian source alludes to the crown prince's journey to the Levant. It states, He, Tahaka, came upstream to Thebes in the midst of fine youths. His Majesty, King Shebitku, justified, went after them to Nubia. He was with them. He loved him more than all his brothers. He passed by the home of Amen Gempaten, and he worshipped before the door of the temple with the army of his Majesty, sailing north together with him. Crown Prince Tahaka then joined Hezekiah and his army against the Assyrians. The confusion in the biblical accounts concerning the correct name of the Egyptian Nubian king can be ascribed to the fact that the existing narrations were drawn up at a date after 690 BC when it was one of the current facts of life that Tahaka was king of Egypt and Nubia. The Assyrian historical annals give a more detailed account of the battle and its aftermath. The officials, nobles, and people of Ekron, who had thrown Padi, their king, bound by treaty to Assyria, into fetters of iron, and had given him over to Hezekiah the Jew, he kept him in confinement like an enemy. They became afraid, and called upon the Egyptian kings, the bowmen, chariots and horses of the king of Meluha, a countless host, and these came to their aid. In the neighborhood of the city of Altaku, their ranks being drawn up before me, they offered battle. Trusting in the aid of Assur, my lord, I fought with them and brought about their defeat. The Egyptian charioteers and princes, together with the charioteers of the Egyptian king, my hands took alive in the midst of the battle. I besieged el and Timnah, conquered them and carried their spoils away. I assaulted Ekron and killed the officials and patricians who had committed the crime and hung their bodies on poles around the city. As to Hezekiah, the Jew, he did not submit to my yoke. I laid siege to forty-six of his strong cities, walled forts, and to the countless small villages in their vicinity. I drove out of them two hundred, one hundred and fifty people. Himself I made a prisoner in Jerusalem. 
his royal residence like a bird in a cage. Hezekiah and Judah made a disastrous miscalculation when they decided to rebel against Assyria, but the Egyptian Nubians made an even more fatal mistake because their interference in Assyrian affairs would eventually lead to the collapse of their dynasty. While Sennacherib's war against the Egyptians was the first of its kind, it was short-lived, and he never attempted an actual invasion of Egypt. However, Sennacherib's successor, Esar Haddon, 680-669 BC, took the next logical step and attempted two invasions of Egypt. Esar Haddon's attack in 674 was unsuccessful, but he was finally able to conquer Egyptian territory on the edge of the eastern delta in 671 BC. Esar Haddon first made a show of strength at the border of Egypt by conquering Phoenicia and the Levant before setting his sights on Egypt. Assyria's successful invasion of Egypt was commemorated on an alabaster tablet from Ashur that reads, I cut down with the sword and conquered. I caught like a fish and cut off its head. I trod up on Arza at the brook of Egypt. I put Asuhili, its king, in fetters and took him to Assyria. I conquered the town of Bazu in a district which is far away. Upon Kanea, king of Tilmun, I imposed tribute due to me as his lord. I conquered the country of Shupria in its full extent and slew with my own weapon Ik Teshup, its king, who did not listen to my personal orders. I conquered Tyre, which is an island amidst the sea. I took away all the towns and the possessions of Balu, its king, who had put his trust on Tirhaka, king of Nubia. I conquered Egypt, Paturisi and Nubia. Its king, Tirhaka, I wounded five times with arrow shots and ruled over his entire country. I carried much booty away. All the kings from the islands amidst the sea, from the country Iardana, as far as Tarsisi, bowed to my feet, and I received heavy tribute from them. The details in this particular inscription are historically important because they not only place Tahaka, the ruling Egyptian king, at the scene of the battle, but also claim that he was wounded. Another Assyrian text, known as the Senjiral Stella, offers even more interesting details about the battle. I led siege to Memphis, his royal residence, and conquered it in half a day by means of mines, breaches, and assault ladders. I destroyed it, tore down its walls, and burnt it down. His queen, the women of his palace, Usha Nahuru, his heir apparent, his other children, his possessions, horses, large and small cattle beyond counting, I carried away as booty to Assyria. All Ethiopians I deported from Egypt, leaving not even one to do homage to me. Everywhere in Egypt I appointed new local kings, governors, officers, harbor overseers, officials, and administrative personnel. I installed regular sacrificial dues for Ashur and the other great gods, my lords, for all times. I imposed upon them tribute due to me as their overlord, to be paid annually without ceasing. Around 700 BC, King Sennacherib transformed Nineveh into the Assyrian capital. Although Assur did not lose its religious and commercial importance, from this point on the empire was no longer administered from the city. Instead, from his throne in Nineveh, the king knew where the peace was maintained and where it was broken. Messengers relayed signals from fire towers or wrote dispatches on clay tablets. In September of 655 BC, Sennacherib's army set off to the kingdom of Elam on the Persian Gulf. The Elamites marched to meet them, but they were cut down by the chariots and horsemen of the Assyrians. In their hour of victory, Sennacherib recorded the following inscription, I cut off their precious lives as one cuts a string. Like the many waters of a storm, I made the contents of their gullets and entrails run down upon the wide earth. My prancing steeds, harnessed for my riding, plunged into the streams of their blood as into a river. With the bodies of their warriors, I filled the plain like grass. The inscription continued in even more frightening detail, revealing the brutality and cruelty that the Assyrians were capable of. Among the victims was the Elamite king, Tuman, 
who was beheaded when his chariot turned over as he attempted to flee. The trophy was brought to the Assyrian king, who slashed it, spat on it, and had it hung as a gruesome trophy on a tree for all to see, even while he and the queen enjoyed a banquet. When the Assyrian king returned to Nineveh, his triumphs were immortalized in room after room of his massive palace. The shocking scenes on clear display to visiting ambassadors from distant realms. Assyria's policy towards Israel, the Levant, and Egypt can be viewed from the perspective of a stronger, more militaristic people who use their might to overpower their weaker foreign neighbors. But its policy towards Babylon was a little more complicated. In the periods when Assyria was strong and Babylon was weak, primarily in the Neo-Assyrian period, the Assyrians were often reluctant to take over the city and surrounding region outright, perhaps because Babylon directly influenced culture and was the older of the two. By 722 BC, Assyria governed Babylon directly. But during the rule of the six major Neo-Assyrian kings, approximately twenty transitions of power took place in Babylon. Sennacherib found Babylon particularly troublesome because he was opposed there by a coalition of Chaldeans, Arameans, native Babylonians, and Elamites in 691 BC. A fifteen-year siege ensued, which ended in the Assyrian destruction of Babylon. The Assyrian annals read, At the beginning of my kingship, I brought about the overthrow of the Merodach Baladan king of Babylonia, together with the armies of Elam in the plain of Kish. In the midst of that battle, he forsook his camp, made his escape alone, fled to Gazumanu, went into the swamps and marshes, and thus saved his life. The chariots, wagons, horses, mules, asses, camels, and Bactrian camels, which he had forsaken at the onset of battle, my hands seized. Into his palace in Babylon I entered joyfully, and I opened his treasure house. Gold, silver, vessels of gold and silver, precious stones of all kinds, goods and property, an enormous heavy treasure, his wife, his harem, his courtiers and attendants, all his artisans, as many as there were, his palace servants, I brought out, I counted as spoil, I seized. Sennacherib's destruction of Babylon did not permanently destroy the great city. In fact, the Babylonians would later play a role in the destruction of the Assyrian Empire, but it did serve to pacify the city for some time. Esar Hatton generally followed the same policy towards Babylon as his predecessors when he gave his son, Shamash Shuma-Ukin, the kingship of Babylon. However, Shamash Shuma-Ukin rebelled against his younger brother, Ashur-Banipal, who was the king of Assyria in 652. Ashur-Banipal had to campaign for several years in order to pacify Babylon once more, which drained the royal coffers and was ultimately part of the Assyrians' own demise. The Decline and Rediscovery of Assur The Neo-Assyrians were the unquestioned masters of the region for a considerable period of time, begging the question of how they suffered a permanent decline. First, they overreached by expanding their empire beyond the existing network of roads, making administration impossible. More importantly, with their entire worldview based on the idea that there was a constant threat of apocalypse if their armies ever lost a battle, the loss of a single battle had cataclysmic repercussions. That eventually happened. In 612 BC, the city of Nineveh was conquered by Assyria's united enemies, and the Neo-Assyrian Empire came to its end. The great city of Assur was also sacked, and a society over a thousand years old collapsed, with its empire totally vanishing. However, the idea of empire was just getting started, and it was their successors, the Persians, that perfected the model of almost all land-based empires throughout later history. The Achaemenids were the first dynasty of the Persian Empire, founded in 539 BC by King Cyrus the Great. Cyrus and his nomadic warriors conquered most of Mesopotamia, including the homelands of Babylon and Assyria. Assur briefly lost its importance as the major center of trade and religion after its destruction in 614 BC, 
But unlike the Assyrians, the Persians ruled with a relatively light touch. Conquered kingdoms were allowed to keep their elite rulers and ways of life, as long as they pledged allegiance and paid taxes to the Persian king, and thus the Persian ruler became known as the King of Kings. This taxation was not too high. The Persians implemented an improved infrastructure of roads, and they facilitated freedom of religion. They were not interested in converting the people of the empire to their faith, Zoroastrianism, which was one of the world's first monotheistic religions. During the 4th century BC, Alexander the Great of Macedon expanded his empire from the Mediterranean across Eurasia with unprecedented speed. Alexander did what the Spartans and Athenians had failed to do for decades. He destroyed the Persian Empire, first at the landmark victory at the Battle of Isis in Turkey in 332 BC, then by sacking the Persian capital of Persepolis in 331 BC. However, Alexander was not very good at empire building. He specialized in conquering and destroying imperial powers, not the building up of institutions to replace these. Soon after his death in 323 BC, Alexander's empire broke up into three Hellenistic dynasties, of which Assur came under the control of the Seleucids. Assur survived the collapse of the Persian Empire and was initially controlled by the kingdom of the Seleucids until the 2nd century BC when it was conquered by the Parthians. The Parthians were originally a tribe called the Parni from a semi-nomadic confederacy, the Dehi, who originated from Central Asia. About 250 BC, the Parni, led by their king Arsaces, conquered the Seleucid satrapy of Parthia, from which their empire gained their name. Throughout the 2nd century BC, the Parthians greatly expanded their territory, and by the reign of King Mithridates II, 121-91 BC, their empire stretched from India to Armenia. The Parthians nearly matched Roman power, repelling them by making full use of their superior cavalry, the heavily armed cataphracts and horse archers. Because of this, Roman incursions did not reach as far as Assur throughout the 1st century BC or 1st century CE, though evidence from other Assyrian sites, such as Hatra, indicates that the campaigns of Septimius Severus were remarkably close. Assur became an important administrative seat of the Parthian government, though the city was completely destroyed and rebuilt a number of times during the Parthian period. A large palace was erected in the southeast part of the settlement, and several new temples were built. During this time, the city's residents buried their dead outside of the, by then ruined, fortification walls, originally built by Shalmaneser III. A palace and temple close to the ziggurat of Ashur are the best preserved testimonies of this time. This splendid structure contained particularly fine Parthian architectural elements. The complex consisted of a Shabastan arrangement of four iwans, large rectangular vaulted niches, with one side left open in a cruciform layout surrounding a central square courtyard, not dissimilar to the caravansaries and mosques that were appearing elsewhere in the east. The ceiling was held up by flat platforms of mud brick, though evidence of transverse arches has also been discovered throughout the complex. A new mysterious religion appeared in the region from the 1st century CE, Christianity. Although initially persecuted as the Roman Empire declined, Emperor Constantine allowed the worship of Jesus and eventually converted to Christianity himself. The religion gathered strength and flourished in an empire with a common language that facilitated its spread. Slowly, Christian cells appeared across the Levant and Near East, the opening up of the religion to non-Jews was the central reason that Christianity spread so far across the continent. Christianity flourished in northern Iraq from the late 2nd century onwards, where it was known as the Church of the East. This church was separated from the Western Church based in Rome through various political and dogmatic developments which had reached its climax with the formal schism between Rome and Constantinople in 1054. One of the most notable differences was that the Church of the East closely followed the teachings of Nestorius. Although no Christian material remains have been discovered at Assur, 
Nestorian Christianity reached its highest point during the 8th and 9th centuries and was surely being practiced in the region by this time. Thanks to the stability caused across Eurasia by the Mongol invasions of the 13th and 14th centuries, the multi-ethnic sect had spread as far as China. Moreover, Mongol rule also signaled the end of the spread of Christianity in the ancient land of Assyria. Tamerlane, also known as Timur Lenk, the Lame, was a 14th century turco mongolian warlord who followed in the wake of the Mongol invasion of the Eurasian steppe. As a convert to Islam, Tamerlane swept away everything in his path as he conquered Iran in 1370. During this campaign, his treatment of the Christian communities that he found was bloody and brutal. Many thousands of Christians were murdered. The great Christian Assyrian stronghold of Tikrit was besieged and eventually fell, and a similar fate befell Assur. This marked the end of Assur. Its population had practically ceased to exist, its structures lay in ruins, and eventually it was buried under the sands of time. Before the 19th century, little was known of the Assyrian Empire beyond what was provided by biblical sources, and although what was told in the Bible is remarkably reliable, after historians were able to compare it with the Assyrians' own records, it provided a limited and biased perspective of Assyrian society. The ruins at Assur attracted minimal attention from the earliest explorers and researchers in the region, as the site lay a fair distance from the more familiar roads in Mesopotamia. In 1847 and 1850, the British archaeologist Austin Henry Layard briefly visited the site, and was followed a few years later by his colleague Hormuzd Rassam, famed for having discovered the tablets inscribed with the Epic of Gilgamesh, the world's oldest written work of literature, at the library of Ashurbanipal at Nineveh in 1853. They had but little interest in the site, discovering little, aside from a statue of Shalmaneser III. After centuries of erosion by wind and rain, the ziggurat had lost its shape, the ancient palaces had crumbled, and the foundations of most of the other structures were hidden beneath the earth. Compared to other sites that were frequently mentioned in biblical sources, such as Babylon, Ur, and Nippur, Assur remained relatively unknown. Much of what is now known about Assur is thanks to the work of the German archaeologist Robert Koldewey, 1855-1925, who excavated the site from 1903, and Walter Andre, 1875-1956, another German archaeologist working with the German Oriental Society, who was appointed as director of the excavations at Assur between 1903 and 1914. Together, they revealed an enormous ruined site, covering an area of approximately 321 acres. Koldewey was primarily interested in finding the legendary Hanging Gardens of Babylon, and spent 20 years excavating there between 1899 and 1917. After revealing a large part of Assur, Koldewey put his considerably talented colleague, André, in charge of the large excavation project. At a young age, André combined his skills as an archaeologist and architect with his artistic talent to create some of the finest archaeological reports created in the early 20th century. His methodologies were pioneering in many ways, effectively making use of stratigraphic excavation techniques, immaculately recorded through the detailed and imaginative drawings of the plans, sections, and reconstructions uncovered. He made use of a series of trial trenches to establish the total size of the city, and an overview of its most important structures. Through his work, the deepest layers of the site were reached, and in the oldest strata, he realized that this was one of the earliest and most important sites of Assyria. André recovered a great number of small finds during these excavations. Of particular value was the corpus of documentary material that was recovered in the form of cylinder seals and inscribed baked clay tablets in the cuneiform script. Cylinder seals were made of clay or stone, and finally engraved with a bas-relief negative image, which, when rolled in clay, would leave an image. They were used in Assur from at least the Sumerian period of occupation. 
though there continues to be a heated debate as to whether the use of such cylinder seals came to Assur from Anatolia or southern Mesopotamia. At Assur, they were made of stone, clay, red marble, and lapis lazuli, an expensive and rare material that would have been imported from Afghanistan. The seal impressions rarely provided any script. Instead, the matrix would usually have depicted scenes of deity worship, symbolic animals, and geometric designs. One dating from the 13th century BC, discovered in the Ishtar temple, depicts a ziggurat, a figure leaving offerings in ceremonial containers, and the eight rays of a star representing Ishtar. Of even greater scholarly value are the sources written in cuneiform, such as the foundation document of Adad Nirari I, 1305-1274 BC, discovered in the cellar of the Ishtar temple, an eight-sided prism inscribed during the reign of Tiglath Pileser of the first, and the 12th century BC tablet of Middle Assyrian laws found in between the old palace and the temple of Anu Adad, one of many in Assur that seems to have been compiled by the city rulers over time to create a corpus of legal precedents to form their codes. Not all of these documents were made of clay or stone either. A hoard of copper and bronze objects, dating from the late 3rd millennium BC, was discovered in the temple of Ashur in 1913, which contained a small golden tablet, a foundation document, dating from the reign of King Tukulti Ninuta I. During the time of Andrei's excavations, Assur was within the territory of the Ottoman Turkish Empire. Most of the artifacts recovered from the site during these excavations were brought to Baghdad, where, after a series of negotiations, many were transported to Europe. Many found their way to the Forda Asi Astitia section of the recently completed Pergamon Museum of Berlin. There, Andre continued to make use of his visionary talents, assembling an exhibition of artifacts that, including complete reconstructions of monuments from Babylon and an entire wing of the museum, was devoted to the finds from Assur. After World War I, a number of German archaeologists and philologists focused their attention on the interpretation of the material remains of Assur, while in Germany thousands of visitors gazed with interest at the wonderful objects that had been sent there from the Near East. However, the outbreak of World War II in 1939 forced the museum to close and the artifacts to be packed into crates. They survived the war in hiding within the depths of the Pergamon Museum basement, but after the liberation of Berlin by the Russians in 1945, they were transported to the Soviet Union, though most were returned to the museum in 1958. It was not until 1945 that the Iraqi government began to take an interest in the site. From 1978, their work focused on the excavation and restoration of the Ziggurat area, Temple of Ashur, and city walls. Still, many questions remain to be answered of Assur, especially regarding the earliest phases of the site's occupation. Since so few accurately dated monuments have been discovered in the region, the precise origins of many of the monumental structures and sculptures continue to be shrouded in mystery. Furthermore, the languages of the ancient Assyrians are not yet fully understood, for all these reasons, the site remains of great interest to scholars all over the world, and in the future, further work will surely take place. Although Assur is by far the most intensively excavated Assyrian city, it is also the least preserved. Heritage sites in Iraq are frequently looted, and there is widespread trafficking of cultural property across the country's borders. The ruined city has recently faced another serious danger, a new dam project that threatened to submerge the entire site. The driving factor of this project was the international conflict over freshwater resources in the region. In recent years, dams have been constructed upriver, and as a result, downstream Iraq has faced serious water shortages. Saddam Hussein had planned to construct a dam downriver from Assur, and if the plan had gone ahead, the entire ancient city would have been completely submerged. The project was put on hold following the fall of the Hussein regime, but Iraq's water shortage problem remains unsolved, and the project may be considered again in the future. 
Due to this unique situation, in 2003, Asur was simultaneously added to both UNESCO's World Heritage List and the World Heritage in Danger List, and it remains to be seen if the site will survive the most recent conflicts taking place in the region. Location and Geography of Nineveh The location of cities in the ancient Near East played a vital role concerning a city's potential success or failure. Cities located on hills could be more easily defended, those in fertile regions could support large populations, and cities located on major bodies of water could use the advantage for transportation purposes. Although Nidomir developed later than other cities in its region, it too was built with geographical considerations. Nineveh was located in the wider geographic region known as the Fertile Crescent, but more specifically in the northern Mesopotamian region known as Assyria. Mesopotamia is derived from the Greek term land between two rivers, because most of it sits inside the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. In particular, most of Assyria was located on either side of the Tigris River, and Nineveh in particular was built on a mound that overlooked the Kosa River, which is a tributary of the Tigris. The location of Nineveh in relation to the other major Assyrian cities was mentioned in the first book of the Old Testament, Genesis. The verses state, And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, Even as Nimrod the might before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalneh in the land of Shinar. Out of that land went forth Ashur, and builded Nineveh, and the city Rehoboth and Kalah, and Resin between Nineveh and Kalah, the same is a great city. Although many parts of the Old Testament, including these passages, are anachronistic, they demonstrate that not only was Nineveh an important city to the Assyrians, but also to non-Assyrian peoples. The passage also shows that the Hebrews of the 5th century BC, which is when the books of the Old Testament were put into writing, were cognizant of Nineveh's location in the region. The Hebrews and other non-Assyrians saw Assyria as a place of power and fertility. As part of the Fertile Crescent, the area around Nineveh was known for its agricultural abundance. Despite being located in the center of the Fertile Crescent, not all of Assyria was equally abundant. Ashur, which was the first Assyrian capital and primary religious center, was relatively fertile, but the area to its north, where Nineveh was located, was much more fertile. The precise reason why the latter Assyrian kings chose to dedicate most of their time and resources to Nineveh over Ashur is unknown, but it may have to do with its greater agricultural output. Since the Assyrians were a particularly warlike people, they constantly needed to keep a large standing army and to support that army, they needed large amounts of grain to feed the men, horses, and other livestock that accompanied the army on campaigns. In the pre-modern world, only a city located close to a fertile region could handle such logistics in a reasonable fashion. A cuneiform text from the Neo-Assyrian king, Sennacherib, 704-681 BC, relates how fertile the region was around Nineveh, and how the king artificially increased that productivity. The text states, To increase the productiveness of the cultivable fields, from the border of the city of Kisiri to the plain of Nineveh, I cut through the hills, mountains, with iron pickaxes, ran a canal over one and a half beru of ground, from the place where the Husur lets down its ancient waters too low for irrigation, and I made the water flow through those fields in irrigation ditches. Luckenbill, 1989 the creation of canals and dikes to artificially modify the environment and topography of Nineveh was a common tactic the later Assyrian kings used quite frequently, as will be discussed later, to create their opulent gardens, and in this case, to increase the productivity of a region. The Husur mentioned in the previous text is Luckenbill's translation of the Kossa River, and the mountains the king cut through was the range that is known as the Sinjar today. The rich soil around Nineveh and its proximity to the Tigris River allowed it to become one of the leading metropolises of the ancient Near East, but its transition to greatness was a process that took hundreds of years. Controversy over the Hanging Gardens As the first millennium BC dawned in the Near East, the Assyrian Empire extended its reach throughout most of the region. 
numerous peoples, some who had built their own large and impressive kingdoms, came under the direct control of the Assyrians. The control of such a large empire was difficult and required much manpower, but one of the many benefits was that it gave the Assyrian kings access to resources they previously did not have in their homeland. The Assyrian kings used the newly acquired resources to aggrandize their existing cities and, in the case of Nineveh, essentially built a new one. The Assyrian king credited with rebuilding Nineveh and making it The Assyrian king credited with rebuilding Nineveh and making it a royal palace was Sennacherib, 704-681 BC, whose activities in the city are well documented in a number of cuneiform sources. Sennacherib officially moved the Assyrian capital from Ashur to Nineveh in 704 BC after his fifth major military campaign. Nineveh was suddenly thrust from a provincial backwater with reasonable religious significance to the most important city in the ancient Near East, although Ashur retained its importance as a cult center for the god Ashur. Sennacherib's building at Nineveh is believed by modern scholars to have been the most ambitious program in Assyrian history, and certainly the best documented. The inscriptions that detail the project are lengthy and give a detailed look into the progression. Parts of the inscriptions relate that Nineveh was indeed a backwater when Sennacherib came to the throne. It reads, At that time Nineveh, the noble metropolis, the city beloved of Ishtar, wherein all are the meeting places of gods and goddesses, the everlasting substructure, the eternal foundation, whose plan had been designed from of old, along with the writing of the constellations, and whose structure had been made beautiful, the beautiful artistic place, the abode of divine law, into which had been brought all kinds of artistic workmanship, every secret and pleasant plan, where from of old kings who went before my fathers had exercised the lordship over Assyria before me, and had ruled the subject of Enlil, but not one among them had turned his thoughts, nor brought his mind to widen the city's area, to build a wall, to lay out streets, or to dig a canal, and to set out trees, nor to the palace therein, the royal abode and dwelling place, whose area was too small, whose construction was not artistic, had he given his energy nor his heart's thoughts. But I, Sennacherib, king of the universe, king of Assyria, gave my thought and brought my mind to accomplish this work according to the command, will of the gods. The people of Chaldea, the Arameans, the Manians, the people of the lands of Ku and Kilaku, of Philistia and Tyre, who had not submitted to my yoke, I deported from their lands made them carry the head pad and mould bricks. Another important detail related in this inscription is the nature of the labour used to build the city. The Assyrian practice of deporting rebellious peoples within their empire was quite common, and, as this passage shows, many of those peoples were used as slave labour in major building projects. No doubt the workers listed provided manual, not skilled labour, and the work was probably quite dangerous. As the slave laborers toiled to build Nineveh, the crowning achievement and literal high point was the king's royal palace. Overlooking the Kosser River was a large mound that provided the settlers of Nineveh with a defensive point where they could build a citadel. Citadels were important in the ancient Near East because they provided an extra layer of security within a city. The first layer of security for ancient Near Eastern cities was the wall that encircled the entire city. If the besieging enemy breached the city walls, then the next line of defense was the citadel, which was the highest point of the city where the palace and the most important temples were usually located. The most famous of all ancient citadels in the ancient world was the Acropolis of Athens, but many major ancient cities had one. Nineveh was fortunate enough to possess two citadels, one of which housed the royal palace that Sennacherib built, and the one that was later built by Ashur Banipal, as well as the most important temples in Nineveh. Cuneiform texts detail the type of material used to build the palace and the material's provenance. The text states, Near Nineveh, in the land of Balatai, by decree of the god, white limestone was found, appeared in abundance, and bull colossi and sculptured statues of alabaster, which were carved out of one stone of enormous proportions, towering high upon their own bases. 
alabaster cow colossi, whose appearance was splendid, whose bodies shone like the bright day. Great slabs of breccia I fashioned and cut free on both sides in their mountain, and had them dragged to Nineveh for the construction of my palace. The huge bull colossi and cow colossi of white limestone, with Ninkura's help, I caused to be begotten and made complete as to their members. The fact that the limestone used to build the royal palace was quarried from the mountains near Nineveh points to another reason why Silasharib may have decided to invest so heavily in the region. Without the benefits of modern construction equipment and techniques, hauling large blocks of heavy stone was a difficult proposition. A similar example can be seen in Egypt. The pyramids of Giza were built right next to a limestone quarry, which made hauling the heavy blocks a bit easier. Unfortunately, time and the enemies of the Assyrians, as will be discussed thoroughly below, destroyed much of Nineveh's royal palace, but a number of pictorial reliefs have survived that paint a vivid picture of Assyrian life in the first millennium BC. The first modern examination of Nineveh took place in the early 19th century by British Orientalist Claudius James Rich, who was able to conduct a complete survey of the ruins. Later, other early archaeologists, such as Frenchman Paul Botta and Englishman Christian Rassam, continue to expand modern man's knowledge of ancient Nineveh through their work. During the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the British Museum, led by E. A. Budge, excavated heavily at Nineveh and brought most of the best-preserved artefacts to its museum in London. The wonderful pictorial reliefs from Nineveh, along with the numerous cuneiform texts from the period, help reconstruct a vibrant image of life, not just in Nineveh, but throughout the Assyrian Empire. Most of the pictorial reliefs from Nineveh once adorned the walls of what modern scholars refer to as the Southwest and North Palaces, due to their location on the citadel vis-à-vis -vis the city below. The Southwest Palace was built and occupied by Sennacherib, while the North Palace was built and occupied by Ashur Banipal. The reliefs are of excellent workmanship and beautiful in their own right, but also often incredibly violent. On one relief from the reign of Sennacherib, Assyrian soldiers, using bows and slings, attack an unseen enemy, while another relief, also from that same king's reign, depicts an Assyrian infantryman pursuing a Babylonian horseman into a marsh. Later Assyrian kings also left their artistic and historical mark on the walls of Nineveh with the addition of reliefs. In particular, Ashur Banipal, who was especially warlike, commemorated his victory over the Elamites at the Battle of Tiltuba with the addition of a series of reliefs at the Southwest Palace. Despite the extreme violence depicted in the scenes, there is also a degree of humanity, as one scene shows an Elamite warrior dragging a mortally wounded comrade to safety. A relief from the North Palace of Nineveh also depicts the events of the same battle, but offers further details concerning the fate of the Elamite king, Umanaldash. In the relief, the Elamite king is looking back, perhaps at his lost land, but it is unsure, because part of the section is no longer extant, and is being led away by an Assyrian soldier who firmly grasps his wrist. War scenes were not the only images that adorned the walls of Nineveh's royal palaces. Extant examples also depict some of the Assyrians' theological beliefs. Many of the religious-themed reliefs from the North Palace depict different types of protective spirits that were believed to watch over the king. In one two-register relief, a group of lion-headed man-beasts called Ugalus stand watch with drawn daggers, while underneath on the bottom a creature known as Urmahili, a creature with a lion's body and the torso and head of a man, basically a lion centaur, holds his hands up in a protective pose. Another relief shows three human-like figures holding small axes above their heads. Modern scholars believe the figures are part of the Sibiti, which were seven Assyrian gods that corresponded to the modern constellation of the Pleiades. The inside of the palaces at Nineveh must have been an impressive sight, and on the citadel, next to the southwest and north palaces, were the temples of the most important Assyrian deities, Ishtar and Nabu. As noted above, Sennacherib's southwest palace overlooked the Kosa River and the rest of Nineveh, but it also gave the king a prime view of his gardens and royal zoo. Although the Assyrians took great pride in their military prowess, 
and were brutally efficient in the art of war, they also enjoyed the finer things in life. Besides the art from the palaces discussed previously, the Assyrians built incredible gardens, which Stephanie Daly has argued were the inspiration for the hanging gardens of Babylon. By the time Sennacherib built his gardens, the tradition of Assyrian garden building was already hundreds of years old. The first gardens that can be definitively documented were built during the reign of Tiglath Pileser I, whose gardens used state-of-the-art irrigation techniques that were later replicated by Sennacherib. Cuneiform inscriptions from the reign of Sennacherib detail the types of vegetation he planted in his garden. The texts state, By command of the god within the orchards, the vine, every fruit-bearing tree, and herbs throve luxuriously. The cypress and mulberry, all kinds of trees, grew large and sent out many shoots. The cane brakes developed rapidly, mightily. The birds of heaven, the iguru birds, built their nests, and the wild swine and beasts of the forests brought forth their young in abundance. The mulberry and the cypress, the product of the parks, the reeds of the brakes which were in the swamp, I cut down and used them as desired in the building of my royal palaces. The passage indicates that Sennacherib's gardens function for aesthetic and practical reasons, as they served to beautify Nineveh and also provided wood for the palaces. It is not known for sure how private these gardens were, but they were probably only open to a select number of the nobility. The term hanging gardens has been ubiquitous for nearly 2,000 years, but one of the problems that English speakers have in conceptualizing the hanging gardens comes from the name itself. The English word hanging evokes, for most readers, images either of a floating garden with suspended plants or at least ivy-type plants that themselves hang below the roots that secure them. In the hanging gardens of Nineveh, Karen Foster lists three different possibilities for how these gardens might have been hanging. 1. Trees and bushes grow on substantial structures, looming or hanging above the head of the viewer. 2. Vines trail over the edges of rooftops, terraces, and pergolas, again looming or hanging above the head of the viewer. And three, plants grow in a sunken area, such that the viewer looms or hangs over the garden, even as the plants appear to be suspended or hanging without visible means of support. The Greek word kremastos is an adjective derived from the root verb kremao. The verb and adjective are used to describe people hanging from the gallows, and objects hanging from people's necks. But interestingly, the Septuagint translation of the book of Ezekiel provides the closest parallel to this context. The prophet Ezekiel is painting a word picture in his oracle about the king of Judah being taken to Babylon, and the English translation of the Greek Septuagint at this point reads as follows. Therefore, this is what the Lord says, and it is I who will take some from the select parts of the cedar, I will snip off something from the top of their heart, and it is I who will transplant on a high mountain, and I will hang, Kremaso him, in a mountain of Israel high in the air, and I will transplant him, and he shall produce a shoot and bear fruit, and become a large cedar. In the Hebrew original, the verb at the end of verse 22, translated by the Greek translators as transplant, is the same exact verb that they translated as hang at the beginning of verse 23. The Hebrew word satal is one of several Hebrew verbs meaning to plant, but its meaning is very specific. It is not a native word in Hebrew, but was borrowed from Akkadian during the Babylonian captivity. The verb only appears in the works of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and two late psalms. The noun sitlu refers to offshoots of vines and trees. The verb that was formed from this noun essentially means to make an offshoot. In other words, it suggests planting or transplanting an offshoot of a tree or vine in a cultivated setting where it would not grow otherwise. When this passage is viewed in light of the adjective for the famous gardens at Babylon, a hitherto unrecognized technical meaning becomes evident. In addition to their standard verb for transplant, the Greek translators used a technical term for planting a tree on a hilly terrace. It is in light of the Ezekiel passage that the Greek phrase hanging gardens makes more sense, and there is no need to turn to the three possible interpretations of the usual sense of hanging outlined by Foster in order to understand the construction and nature of these gardens. 
The Greek phrase hanging gardens likely referred to artificially planted gardens that were set on a slope. This coincides with all of the classical sources that survived antiquity. The relevant passages read as follows. According to Strabo, it consists of arched vaults, which are located on checkered cube-like foundations. The ascent of the uppermost terrace roofs is made by a stairway. Philo makes similar comments. The hanging garden has plants cultivated above ground level, and the roots of the trees are embedded in an upper terrace rather than in the earth. The whole mass is supported on stone columns. The longest passage in this regard comes from Diodorus Siculus. And since the approach to the garden sloped like a hillside, and the several parts of the structure rose from one another, tier on tier, the appearance of the whole resembled that of a theatre. When the ascending terraces had been built, there had been constructed beneath them galleries which carried the entire weight of the planted garden, and rose little by little, one above the other, along the approach, and the uppermost gallery, which was fifty cubits high, bore the highest surface of the park, which was made level with the circuit wall of the battlements of the city. In each case, the author emphasizes the sloping and hill-like nature of the artificial and man-made structures in which the plants and trees grew. It is this feature that the hanging likely described, and as such, the description of Philo at Byzantium is most likely an error. Given this context, Philo's description reads more like an unwarranted elaboration by a writer who had not visited the garden itself. Unfamiliar with the technical term and its use in agricultural contexts, Philo of Byzantium used the broader meaning of the Greek term to let his imagination run wild. If Nebuchadnezzar II had the hanging gardens built at Babylon for his wife, as the legend goes, then these gardens should have constituted a prominent feature of the landscape of the city. Just as visitors and travelers commented on the other wonders when they visited those cities, one would expect effusive praise and detailed descriptions of these gardens whenever the topic of Babylon came up. After all, the authors who did mention the gardens described at length and in great detail both the beauty of the site and its technical ingenuity. However, multiple reliable authors exclude this expected feature from their descriptions of Babylon, its landscape and environs. Herodotus described Babylon in great detail, and he mentions the walls of Babylon, its palaces, its temples, and the customs associated with these temples. But he didn't make a single mention of these famed gardens. The absence is so glaring that Stephanie Daly, a scholar at Oxford University, who has pioneered the recent research into the Hanging Gardens, entitled one of her recent articles, Why Did Herodotus Not Mention the Hanging Gardens of Babylon? In this article, Daly begins by affirming a fact that late 19th century scholars doubted that Herodotus likely did visit Babylon and have first-hand knowledge of the city. She goes on to demonstrate that the Neo-Babylonian Empire to which Nebuchadnezzar II belonged considered itself the continuation of the Neo-Assyrian Empire by pointing to various attempts to maintain a sense of continuity between the two dynasties. After making these two important points, Daly asks her original question again. Why did Herodotus not mention the Hanging Gardens? Other well-known ancient historians are also silent on the matter. No mention of the Hanging Gardens appears in the Cyropedia by Xenophon either. This work was a biography of sorts of Cyrus the Great, and Babylon features prominently as one of the empires that Cyrus destroyed. Here again, the absence of any mention of the Hanging Gardens is glaring. In addition to those two famous Greek writers, several renowned Roman historians fail to mention the existence of the gardens. In Plutarch's biography of Alexander the Great, there is nothing about the Hanging Gardens. Perhaps just as surprising is the description of Babylon in Pliny the Elder's Natural History, where he describes the walls of Babylon and the great temple of Jupiter Bell, but makes no mention of the Hanging Gardens. The Hanging Gardens, as described in other classical sources, are exactly the type of topographic feature that Pliny set out to describe for readers, yet they do not even warrant a nod from him. After taking the time to summarize all of the available classical descriptions of the Hanging Gardens, the scholar E. A. Wallace Budge found them to be so self-contradictory that he declared emphatically, In my opinion, a garden of this size and kind never existed at Babylon.
However, historians are quite used to their ancient sources being at odds with each other on various details. After all, if history were so straightforward, even fewer historians would be able to make a living sorting these questions out. A consideration of the historical topography of the region creates another formidable problem in relation to the Hanging Gardens. One of the reasons why archaeologists have had a field day in Mesopotamia is that the land is so flat that the rivers do not remain in a fixed course for long. They were continually diverted into new courses in antiquity by either natural phenomena, such as flooding in the wet season, or artificially engineered changes in direction. For this reason, ancient cities that were originally built along the course of the river became abandoned and desolate centuries later if the river had changed its course. In the case of Babylon, it was built along the Euphrates River and relied heavily upon the river for transportation of goods, which were sent on barges down the river, as well as its general water supply. The ancient descriptions of the Hanging Gardens indicate that its irrigation system was dependent upon the river, which obviously makes sense, but there are several historical problems based on the following facts. About a quarter of a century after the death of Nebuchadnezzar II, the Persians, led by Cyrus the Great, captured the city of Babylon in 539 BC. As part of their military campaign to force Babylon to submit, the Persians diverted the Euphrates River away from the city, and it remained in its diverted course for centuries afterward, so that it no longer flowed through the palace complex. If the Persians diverted the river away from Babylon in the 6th century, how could 4th century sources like Tessias and Berossus describe to their Greek audience a Babylonian garden watered by a river that was no longer there? In the late 19th century, before archaeologists had excavated the vast caches of cuneiform tablets that can now be found in the British Museum, the Louvre, and other famous museums throughout the world, the classical sources were the closest one came to the ancient Babylonian world. But now, a century and a half later, tens of thousands of these Babylonian cuneiform tablets have been deciphered and translated by scholars. Naturally, those translating the tablets figured that there would be a mention of such gardens by the Babylonians themselves, seeing as how they should have been a point of pride that would have inevitably peppered historical inscriptions and letters. Yet the Babylonian records remain silent on the matter of the Hanging Gardens. One text in particular, entitled The Topography of Babylon, would be the ideal place for the Babylonians to rave about their impressive Hanging Gardens, because this text takes up five cuneiform tablets and describes streets and temples and palaces of Babylon in great detail, yet the tablet says nothing about these famous gardens. Not only are the texts silent on the Hanging Gardens in particular, Gardens and the act of gardening in general was not a subject that took any pride of place in the Babylonian texts available to us, whereas the silence on the part of the classical sources is curious, but not necessarily damning, the silence from native sources should give everyone pause. The silence here is not only limited to the literary sources, but extends to the archaeological record as well. Mesopotamia is one of the most professionally excavated regions in the world, and the city of Babylon, including the main palace complex, has been excavated extensively. Naturally, the first excavation team, led by Robert Caldaway, attempted to both identify and reconstruct the location of the Hanging Gardens within the palace complex. But ultimately, his identification and reconstruction were so faulty that just about every subsequent archaeologist and historian has torn it apart. The original excavation was unable to make a solid identification of the location of the Hanging Gardens, and no subsequent proposal for the location of the Hanging Gardens in Babylon has been able to garner any significant support. All of this has ensured that the Hanging Gardens of Babylon are the most mysterious of all the traditional seven wonders of the ancient world, given the unlikelihood that multiple ancient sources invented something out of thin air with alarmingly matching details, there was probably some magnificent garden in Mesopotamia connected with a queen that astonished the Greeks and the Romans. Yet the classical sources contain significant unexpected gaps in what they relate about the Hanging Gardens within other descriptions of the city of Babylon, and the topography of Babylon changed so significantly in terms of its water supply after the time of Nebuchadnezzar II that it could not have continued to support any such garden within the palace complex either. 
the Babylonian literature itself lacks any clear or even obscure or indirect reference to the Hanging Gardens, and the archaeology of the city of Babylon shows no trace of such a structural complex. This led researchers to one inevitable question. Where would the Hanging Gardens of Babylon have been located if not in Babylon? The gaps in the historical record and the lack of evidence in the archaeological record presented quite a conundrum for those looking for signs of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, but eventually work done in the late 20th century try to make some sense out of the incomplete puzzle. On the face of it, asking whether the Babylon in the Hanging Gardens of Babylon actually referred to the famous city itself is absurd. After all, Babylon was a well-known city in Mesopotamia and served as the capital of the Babylonian Empire for most of its existence. On the other hand, the confusion evident both in the ancient sources and the modern archaeological record concerning the Hanging Gardens indicates that an innovative solution along these lines might just be warranted. Eventually, a Syriologist, Stephanie Daly, asked this bold question that previous scholars had not bothered to ask because it seemed nonsensical. She looked at the classical sources with an eye to whether they confused the city of Babylon or possibly conflated it with any other city, and she didn't have to look long before she found plenty of evidence to this effect. The first important source that she discovered in this connection was a series of astronomical observations from Azakiel of Toledo, written in Aramaic. This document makes reference to the longest day of the year from the perspective of old Babylon. In and of itself, this would not have been a very significant reference, except when it is combined with the identification of the latitude from which the observation must have been made. Based on the latitude calculations, the old Babylon to which this document referred is not the ancient city of Babylon everyone thinks of today, but actually the Assyrian city of Nineveh. If there are ancient references to old Babylon, it begs the question as to the intended referent of its counterpart, New Babylon. Daly painstakingly outlined how and when these names came into use within the native Akkadian sources themselves. When Assyrian leader Sennacherib sacked and destroyed Babylon in 689 BC, his army smashed or removed all of the cult statues of the prominent gods within the city. This left the city godless, with no king and in a state of ruin for a quarter of a century or so, while its former inhabitants lived in exile. It was Sennacherib's son, Esar Haddon, who set to work rebuilding Babylon in an attempt to restore it to its former glory. The restored city that rose out of the ashes of the old was then appropriately dubbed the New Babylon. But this leaves the problem of when exactly Nineveh would have been referred to as Babylon. Although other kings adopted the title King of Babylon after they defeated the city, Sennacherib did not participate in this naming convention. Instead, for evidence that Nineveh was called Babylon, Dali turns to the technical history of the textual tradition of one of the most prominent Akkadian myths, Enuma Elish, the Epic of Creation. In the traditional Old Babylonian version of this epic, Marduk defeats Tiamat and establishes Babylon as the center of the universe. In the Assyrian version of this epic, the god Marduk, who was the traditional god of Babylon, has been replaced by Assur, the eponymous deity of the city of Assur and the Assyrians. What Dali draws attention to is the fact that although the Assyrians took the time to change the name of the deity, who forms the hero of the epic, they left the name of the city that he founded, Babylon, unchanged. For Dali, this makes little sense. If they were concerned about Assyrianizing the epic, why stop at the name of the deity and leave the Babylonian capital as the center of the world? To answer this question, Dali theorizes that the Assyrianizing process took place during the period of Sennacherib's reign, and that while the actual Babylon lay in ruins and was godless, the Assyrians began to call Nineveh by the name Babylon. After all, if Nineveh was referred to as Babylon, there would be no need for any further change to the text of the myth, because the renaming of Nineveh to Babylon would make it the center of the world. The god Assur, as the hero of the epic, now establishes Babylon as the center of the world, and Babylon now refers to Nineveh. Of course, a trained historian is fully aware that an historical argument based on literary evidence such as this could not stand on its own without further support. To provide such support, Dali garnered more evidence from several economic documents dated to Sennacherib's reign. 
The most important thing about these economic documents was the manner in which they were dated. Throughout the history of the two empires, the Assyrian and Babylonian, the two kingdoms used different dating systems. In the Babylonian Empire, they used regnal years, such as the third year of King Nebuchadnezzar II's reign. In the Assyrian Empire, they used what are called their eponyms, as in the year the king did something. In these economic documents, Dali noted an interesting shift. Sennacherib's financial transactions were dated using the expected Assyrian system in the first half of his reign, but in the latter years of his reign, after he had sacked and destroyed Babylon, his scribes began using the Babylonian system of dating. Evidence for the renaming of Nineveh as Babylon by the Assyrians appears in some of the surrounding cultures as well. The books of Chronicles in the Hebrew Bible present a retelling of the history of Israel and Judah, and at one point they describe how the Assyrians took Manasseh captive to their capital city. But when the books name the capital city, they do not use the expected name Nineveh, but instead use the name Babylon. Therefore the Lord brought against them the commanders of the army of the king of Assyria, who took Manasseh captive in manacles, bound him with fetters, and brought him to Babylon. Not only was Babylon not the capital of Assyria, this was the very period when Babylon lay in ruins. As such, it is the exact period when Dali argues that Nineveh was going by the name Babylon. In addition to this Judean source, there is also a Greek source that provides evidence for the use of the name Babylon to refer to Nineveh. Diodorus Siculus describes many exploits of a legendary queen whom he calls Semiramis, and she is identified as an Assyrian queen who was responsible for multiple building projects in Babylon. At that time, however, the Assyrian rulers did not rule over Babylon and just as importantly, the actual details of the building projects indicate that these projects were located in Assyria, most likely in Nineveh, not Babylon. He wrote that Semiramis decorated her building projects with hunting scenes that included a wide variety of animals, and that the queen herself appears on one of these portraits riding horseback and impaling a leopard while her husband spears a lion beside her. As will be discussed further in detail, this type of hunting and artistic imagery was unique to the Assyrians and did not appear in Babylon or as part of Babylonian art. Diodorus Siculus's description on its face makes little sense, and classical scholars have long struggled to understand why Tessius, Diodorus's native source, would have made such an elementary error. But in this new light, by recognizing that Nineveh for a time bore the name Babylon and was referred to as Old Babylon when Babylon was rebuilt and became New Babylon, the story makes perfect sense. An Assyrian queen was responsible for numerous building projects in Nineveh, Old Babylon, and the Assyrian-style hunting scenes scattered throughout these building projects find a home in Nineveh that they would not have found in Babylon. With all of this said, it must be acknowledged that in all of Dali's work on this matter, she has failed to come up with any smoking gun that would remove any doubt as to the use of the name Babylon for Nineveh during Sennacherib's reign. But at the same time, the lack of such a smoking gun also might explain why no one came up with a solution to the problem presented by the Hanging Garden sooner. The solution also has a great deal of explanatory power, since it reconciles the use of the term Old Babylon for Nineveh, and helps explain several other historical oddities mentioned above. Ultimately, the idea of hanging gardens themselves actually bolsters the argument that Nineveh was known as Babylon during the reign of Sennacherib, because one of the biggest differences between Nineveh and Babylon was the emphasis on gardening. Although both Nineveh and Babylon are both situated in what people immediately think of as the dry and arid climate of Mesopotamia, Babylon is located closer to the equator and thus experiences less annual rainfall than Nineveh. Climate maps show that Babylon is located in a region that receives only 100 to 200 millimeters of rainfall per year, whereas the city of Nineveh receives 600 to 1,000 millimeters of rainfall annually. Babylon has a more desert-like climate, while Nineveh is more Mediterranean. These distinct climate differences also express themselves in the distinctive cultures of each region. Understandably, both cultures prized water resources and fostered very adept engineers who mastered the art of controlling the flow of the rivers, 
and developed innovative means for irrigating their fields. But in Babylon, the amount of water was so minimal that the focus of irrigation efforts was almost solely on crop production. The situation in Assyrian Nineveh was markedly different. Although water was still a valuable resource, and one that needed to be protected and maximized, the Assyrians used water more freely than their Babylonian counterparts. The Assyrians not only raised crops, but also grew ornamental gardens and parks, whose purpose was more aesthetic than functional. Assyrian kings also prided themselves on their hunting ability, which was a quite popular form of entertainment and sport in the royal court, and Assyrian kings built Ambasu, which were large game parks where such sporting events could take place, and some of the most popular Assyrian reliefs that the general public is familiar with of those involving the king killing lions with a spear and similar weapons. This matches what is depicted in Tertius's description of the wall that flanked the hanging gardens. The height and width of this wall were even greater than those of the middle wall. On it and on its towers there were again wild beasts of every kind, cleverly drawn and realistically colored to represent a complete big game hunt. These animals were more than six feet long, and Semiramis was portrayed among them, mounted and hurling a javelin at a leopard. By her side was her husband Ninus, dispatching a lion at close quarters with his spear. Such a description does not match any of the Babylonian motifs for art, but is a common theme in Assyrian art. Furthermore, the Assyrians developed a strong literary tradition wherein the king would describe how he constructed various gardens in building inscriptions similar to those used for canals, palaces, and temples. Not only was there such a strong literary tradition for gardens, but the Assyrian scribes used an interesting phrase in their descriptions of these gardens. They used the phrase Tamsil Hamani, in the likeness of the Amanus Mountains, to describe these gardens. This phrase highlights the fact that these gardens were not built in the style of the western gardens of the time that favored symmetry with flowers and trees arranged in a central configuration. Instead, they were constructed in the relatively flat plains of Assyria to model a hilly and wooded terrain with its winding footpaths and streams. The Assyrian monarchs not only conscripted literary descriptions of these gardens, but adorned their palaces with bas-reliefs depicting this lush terrain. Keeping these facts in mind, the presence of the hanging gardens in a place once called Old Babylon, Nineveh, would be entirely in keeping with what is known about the history and the values of the region and the culture. Conversely, trying to fit the hanging gardens into the traditional city of Babylon seems like trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. In the 7th century BC, the Assyrian king Sinasharib used the phrase as a wonder for all people, Anna Dagalu Kisat Nisu in Akkadian, to describe his palace and accompanying gardens. When dealing with two languages as different as Greek and Akkadian, it's important not to get too hung up on the fact that the same English word is used to translate both phrases from these two languages. What is more important in this context is that the Assyrian king, Sennacherib, thought his palace gardens were awe-inspiring for anyone who saw them, whereas the native Babylonian annals and documents make no such references to gardens, and hardly make mention of gardening at all. This isn't that surprising given that the climate of Babylon did not lend itself to parks or gardens. Expending their precious few water resources on such extravagant pursuits as sport and aesthetic enjoyment would have ruined the economy by diverting necessary resources away from the production crops that supplied food for the city. When Strabo described the hanging gardens and its irrigation system in great detail, he used the Greek term cochleas, screw, to describe the mechanism that watered the gardens. This has proved to be another one of the many mysteries associated with the hanging gardens. Archimedes, who is generally credited with the invention of the screw as a water-raising device, did not invent this device until around 250 BC, but it is clear that such a device was being used in Egypt in Ptolemaic times prior to Archimedes' version of the device. The question is whether that engineering design could have been in use in Mesopotamia three centuries before Ptolemy ruled Egypt. There was not a great deal of contact between the two civilizations before the 3rd century, and there is little reason to suspect that Greek engineers would have been allowed to study the technology involved in such an irrigation system. Moreover, because the mechanics of the system were internal, mere observation would not be sufficient to grasp and reproduce such technology. 
That said, the ancient sources discussing the hanging gardens all make mention of some sort of engineering device that could raise water. For instance, Diodorus Siculus wrote, And there was one gallery which contained openings leading from the topmost surface, and machines for supplying the gardens with water, the machines raising the water in great abundance from the river, although no one outside could see it being done. Unless the ancient accounts relating to the irrigation of the hanging gardens are all discounted, it is entirely possible that Mesopotamian agricultural engineers were years ahead of their time. In such an arid climate as Mesopotamia, irrigation technology was a key concern, so it makes sense that a great deal of time and finances were devoted. Stephanie Daly has taken this issue one step further. She found Assyrian texts that describe Sennacherib's palace and its associated gardens, and among these texts was a description of new technology for watering these gardens. In this text, Sennacherib uses a word for the hollowed-out trunk of a palm tree, alamitu, to describe a screw that he used as a water-raising device. He explains how he cast the two separate components of this device using clay molds into which he then poured molten copper or bronze. The correspondence between this native Mesopotamian description and the description given by Strabo is striking to say the least. Here there is a Mesopotamian king boasting not only about the opulence and grandeur of his gardens, but also the technology used to sustain it. Scribes describe the palace that Sennacherib built for himself as the palace without rival in multiple inscriptions. Two of these inscriptions were clay prisms, a popular shape of dedicatory inscriptions during the time, and another set was inscribed on a lion sphinx. The extensive description of the garden associated with this palace appears on the prism inscriptions, and the detailed description of the irrigation system for these gardens appears on the Lion Sphinx inscription without the accompanying description of the garden itself. Perhaps most interesting of all is the dedication that appears on the Lion Sphinx inscription immediately following the description of the Archimedean screw-type water-raising device. It reads, and for Tasmetum Sarat the Queen, the chosen bride, my beloved, whose form, Belet Ili, has made more perfect than that of any other woman. I had a palace of loveliness, joy, and happiness made, and so I put female lion sphinxes of white limestone at its doors. At the command of Asur, father of the gods, and Ishtar, the queen, may we enjoy a long time together in those palaces, in pleasure of the flesh and joy of the heart, May we have our fill of longevity. May a favorable Sedu and a favorable Lamassu always encircle the sides of those palaces forever. May their good omens never cease. Taken in the context of this proposal, Nineveh and Sennacherib would coincide with both traditional legends about the origin of the Hanging Gardens in a broad sense, since the gardens and the palace that they surrounded Nineveh were dedicated to a queen. Furthermore, such a dedication of a building and its gardens to a queen is unique within the Assyrian and Babylonian traditions. One has to go to the Hittite or Luvian inscriptions to find anything comparable. This uniqueness only adds to the likelihood of identifying the hanging gardens with Sennacherib's garden structures at Nineveh as opposed to anything built by Nebuchadnezzar II at Babylon. There is no doubt that Dali's theory that the hanging gardens were in Sennacherib's Nineveh, not Nebuchadnezzar II's Babylon, has many compelling points in its favor, but this reassessment of the historical material creates some new problems. Without question, the most formidable problem relates to the history of Nineveh after Sennacherib, because seemingly all historical sources, including classical, biblical, and Babylonian sources, indicate that the great city of Nineveh met its fate at the hands of a coalition between Nebuchadnezzar II and the Medes in 612 BC. In fulfillment of Assyrian curses and biblical prophecies, the city was flooded and entirely destroyed. Thus, this raises a problem similar to the one regarding the diversion of the Euphrates River from Babylon. If Nineveh was ruined in the early 7th century BC, it is impossible to understand how the magnificent hanging gardens were still standing from the 4th century BC through the 1st century AD, when travelers were acclaiming it as one of the seven wonders of the world. Quintus Curtius Rufus makes the following comment about the hanging gardens, as late as the 1st century AD. Notwithstanding time destroys by insensible erosion, not only human works, but even nature herself, yet this pile, pressed with roots, 
and loaded with the trunks of so gigantic a plantation, still remains entire. That said, the archaeological evidence indicates that the city of Nineveh continued to be occupied throughout the last few centuries BC and the first centuries AD. A building identified as the Hermes Temple was found in 1954 at the site, and the English translation of the Arabic excavation report reads, In October 1954, the custodian of the Nineveh remains directed the attention of Muhammad Ali Mustafa to a piece of limestone he had discovered sticking out of the ground a little more than 100 meters north of the northwest corner of Nebi Yunus. The area surrounding the shrine was examined. It rose about one meter above the surrounding plain and extended for some distance in the south, running under the newly constructed houses. The high elevation suggests a Hellenistic settlement. This is supported by the discovery three years earlier of a limestone altar of Assyrian origin, bearing a cuneiform inscription of Sennacherib on one side and a Greek inscription on the other. The altar was surrounded by pieces of stone and further investigation ascertained that the locality was the site of a large building whose foundations were of large blocks of limestone, perhaps the site of another Hellenistic temple. All these features pointing towards the existence of a Hellenistic settlement in Nineveh have been found on the west side of the city. The difference in situation between that of the multiple problems for Babylon and the Hanging Gardens as compared with the new problems facing Nineveh and the Hanging Gardens is extraordinary. Whereas digging deeper into the historical evidence regarding Babylon and the Hanging Gardens continue to reveal more and more problems with such an identification, the more historical information researchers learn about Nineveh, the fewer problems exist for locating these famed gardens at Nineveh. Nineveh at its peak Perhaps an even more intriguing aspect of Nineveh than its gardens was the royal zoo that Sennacherib built and subsequent Assyrian kings maintained. The previous passage continues and gives more detail concerning the wildlife in the menagerie. To arrest the flow of the water through these orchards, I made a swamp and set out a cane break therein. Igiru birds, wild swine, beasts of the forests, I turned loose therein. In order to determine what specific species and breeds of some of the animals in the king's royal preserve, one only has to view the extant pictorial reliefs from the royal palaces of Nineveh. In one damaged relief from the North Palace, a lion and lioness relax in what appears to be one of the gardens described in the previous text. Cypress and palm trees are also visible, as well as various plants, flowers and grapes. Another relief, also from the North Palace, from the reign of Ashurbanipal, shows men in a wooded area trapping a herd of deer with nets. The lions so peacefully depicted in the first relief from the North Palace are then shown in a three-register relief being hunted and killed by Ashurbanipal and his subjects. The killing of the lions in the reliefs was thought to represent a symbolic victory of order in the form of the king over chaos. But the Assyrian kings carried out such hunts in well-structured environments that included private zoos and game preserves. The concept of royal hunts was popular throughout ancient Near Eastern history and can be seen in the Epic of Gilgamesh and in nearly every culture of the region. The Egyptians, Hittites, and Mycenaeans all depicted their kings as lion hunters. The first Assyrian artistic depictions of a king hunting lions is dated to the reign of Ashur Nasirpal II, 883 to 859, but the reliefs of Ashur Banipal discussed are the first where the king did so in front of spectators. Not much is known about the logistics of the royal zoos of Nineveh, but with such emphasis placed on it in texts and art, one can surmise that a fair amount of royal resources were needed to keep it functioning properly. Sennacherib truly made Nineveh the greatest city in the Near East during its time, but his two successors also did their fair share to keep the city great. Sennacherib's successor was one of his sons, Esarhaddon, 680-669 BC, who came to the throne in a series of inauspicious events. Apparently, one or more of Esarhaddon's brothers conspired to assassinate Sennacherib in order to usurp the throne, but were then killed by the future king. The events are related in the cuneiform inscriptions that commemorate Esarhaddon's coronation. The text reads, 
In the month of Adaru, a favorable month, on the eighth day, a feast day of Nabu, I entered into Nineveh, my royal city, joyfully, and took my seat upon the throne of my father in safety. The south wind blew, the breath of Eos, the wind, whose blowing is favorable for exercising kinship. There awaited me favorable signs in heaven and on earth, a message of the soothsayers, tidings from the gods and goddesses. Continually they gave my heart courage. The soldiers, the rebels who had fomented the plot to seize the rulership of Assyria for my brothers, their ranks I examined to the last man, and I laid a heavy penalty upon them. I destroyed their seed. Besides the details that the text relates concerning the attempted usurpation of the Assyrian throne, the inscription is important because it points out that the coronation was held in Nineveh, Esarhaddon's royal city. Esarhaddon no doubt needed to legitimize his position in the eyes of potentially disloyal nobles and generals, so he opted for continuity at the beginning of his reign. The coronation at Nineveh connected Esarhaddon directly with his father and predecessor which proved to be a wise move, because his rule was one of relative stability. Esar Haddon also followed his father by dedicating a fair amount of royal resources to the palace. Perhaps desiring a greater legacy than his father, Esar Haddon expanded what must have been an already immense royal palace. The texts do not state specifically if it was the southwest or north palace that Esar Haddon remodeled, but a number of details are related. The text reads, at that time, the older palace, which stood in Nineveh, which the kings who went before me, my fathers, had built for the care of the camp, the sheltering of the cavalry, horses, mules, chariots, arms, battle equipment, and enemy plunder, of all sorts, which Asur, king of the gods, granted me as a royal portion. That place had come to seem too small to me for the exercising of horses and the maneuvering of chariots, the people of the lands my arms had captured. I made to carry the basket and head pad, and they made bricks. That small palace I tore down in its entirety. I cut off a piece of land, large enough for my plans, formed the plowland, and added it thereto. With limestone, great blocks from the mountain, I filled in this terrace. I summoned the twenty-two kings of the Hittite land, Syria, of the sea coast, and the islands of the midst of the sea, all of them, and I have them their orders. Great beams and tall trunks, logs or planks of cedar and cypress, from Mount Sirara and Mount Lebanon, I had them dragged to Nineveh with toil and pain. Most of the text relates similar themes that were mentioned by those of his predecessors. The exotic materials needed for the palace's construction were confiscated from faraway lands, and the labor needed to build the structure was provided by foreign slaves. Interestingly, what provided the catalyst for Esarhaddon's renovation was not that the palace lacked comfort, but that it lacked space for military drills. Assyrian kings were true generals who personally led their armies into battle, and this passage proves that those kings took their role seriously by practicing the arts of war while at home in the palace. After Esarhaddon, Nineveh was graced with the presence of his successor and son, Ashur Banipal. Ashurbanipal and Nineveh Ashurbanipal is best known for being a brutal conqueror who subjugated most of the Near East under his rule and displaced perhaps millions of people. Although Ashurbanipal was able to claim the largest empire in the world and it encompassed many of the most culturally sophisticated regions of the time, including Anatolia, Mesopotamia, the Levant and Egypt, his hold over them was often precarious. Egypt in particular, which possessed an advanced culture much older than Assyria's, proved to be a particularly difficult country to control. During the Neo-Assyrian period, Egypt was ruled by the Nubian 25th dynasty, which constantly challenged Assyrian authority under the kings Shabaka and Taharqa. Eventually, under Ashurbanipal, the Assyrians tired of Egypto-Nubian meddling in the Levant and invaded Egypt in a major campaign in late 664 and early 663 BC. The result was that the Egyptian Nubian king Tantamani was deposed, and Ashur Banipal installed a number of Egyptian counts loyal to him to oversee Assyria's interests in Egypt. A cuneiform text relates how he had rebellious Egyptian leaders brought to Nineveh and ruthlessly executed, with the exception of one, 
Tanis and all of the other towns which had associated with them to plot, they did not spare anybody among them. They hung their corpses from stakes, flayed their skins, and covered with them the wall of the towns. Those kings who had repeatedly schemed, they brought alive to me to Nineveh. From all of them I had only mercy upon Necho and granted him life. Eventually Necho's son Samtik, who lived in Ashur Banipal's court in Nineveh for some time, proclaimed independence from Assyria and established the 26th, often referred to as the Sait by modern scholars, for their capital city of Sais dynasty. Although Samtik and his successors pursued their own imperial aims in the Levant, the dynasty maintained cordial relations with the Assyrians and even assisted them in an alliance against the Neo-Babylonians. Besides using Nineveh to host foreign dignitaries and killing some of them, Ashur Banipal also followed in his predecessor's footsteps by making additions to and beautifying the city. According to the cuneiform texts, Esarhaddon had let the walls of Nineveh fall into decay. Perhaps the king believed that there was no reason to dedicate resources to the walls since Nineveh was deep within the Assyrian heartland and there were no rivals to challenge Assyrian power during Esarhaddon's rule. But, as noted previously, the geopolitical situation had changed during Ashur Banipal's rule as the Assyrians began to face constant challenges on their periphery. Ashur Banipal reinforced the walls of Nineveh, perhaps in order to ready the city for a potential attack. The text states, At that time the wall inside the city of Nineveh, which Sennacherib, king of Assyria, the father of the father of my begetter, had built, whose foundation had given way and its turrets fallen on account of the abundant showers and heavy rains which Adad had yearly sent upon my land during my reign. Its weak parts I tore down, its foundation, platform, I strengthened. Once Ashur Banipal repaired the walls of Nineveh, he was free to focus his attention on other aspects of the city that interested him, but unlike his predecessors who fancied gardens, zoos, and military training grounds, Ashur Banipal prized the written word. The Assyrians were inheritors of a long tradition of literacy in Mesopotamia that some would argue reached its pinnacle with them. In particular, the Assyrians displayed a particular affinity to and aptitude for historiography. The Assyrian idea of history was essentially the same as that of their Babylonian neighbors to the south and involved ideas such as the destiny of their kings that was manifested in the past and projected forward into the future. Although Assyrian historical records were written in a particularly meticulous nature, which has helped modern scholars better understand the chronology of the Assyrian Empire, it was for the most part a theocratic history. Besides historical texts, Assyrians recorded omens, Babylonian creation myths, taxes and magical spells. A collection of over 2,300 letters pertaining to taxes have been excavated from the ruins of Nineveh and Kalu, and over 5,000 literary texts from Nineveh alone. The documents at Nineveh represent just a portion of an immense library that Ashur Banipal had built there and is a testament to the warrior king's poetic side. Two particular cuneiform texts now housed in the British Museum London, BM 45642, and BM 28825 detail how the Library of Nineveh was created. In addition to texts that Ashur Banipal had brought to Nineveh from other Mesopotamian cities such as Borsippa and Babylon, the library contained authentic Middle and Neo-Assyrian cuneiform texts written in the Akkadian language which predated the rule of the king. BM 45642 is particularly well preserved and details how Ashur Banipal ordered scribes from Borsippa to copy texts from the Nabu temple referred to as Ezida in that city. Nabu was the Mesopotamian god of knowledge and literacy, so the king's patronage of the deity on behalf of the Nineveh library is appropriate. The text states, Nabu, who dwells in Ezida, bestowed broad understanding, and who, like me, is bowed to the scribal art, we send word thus. Further, the dutiful Borsippans will send back to the king their lord the instruction that he wrote as follows. Write out all the scribal learning in the property of Nabu and send it to me. Complete the instruction. Maybe the king says to himself, We are ones who, like the citizens of Babylon, will shirk it by using confusing language. Now we shall not shirk the king's command. 
we shall write on boards of sisu wood, we shall respond immediately, and regarding the board in Sumerian, the glossary about which you sent word, there is not, but that in e Sangil. Most of the records were recorded on clay tablets, which were the standard in ancient Mesopotamia, but as mentioned on BM 45642, some were written on boards of sisu wood. The sisu wood boards were covered with wax and then inscribed with a cuneiform text, which helped preserve the text better. BM 45642 also relates that the Assyrians had an interest in the Sumerian language, which was long dead as a spoken language by the time the Nineveh Library was built. Erudite Assyrian kings, such as Ashurbanipal and Assyrian scribes, apparently wished to know the Sumerian language so that they could read obscure Sumerian texts and read literary stories such as the Epic of Gilgamesh in its original language. The Assyrian preservation of written Sumerian would be similar to how Roman emperors such as Marcus Aurelius would write poetry and philosophy in Greek despite using Latin in their everyday functions. Another similarity would be members of the papacy using Latin for church functions throughout the Middle Ages, despite it being a dead language, or even how Japanese samurai of the 16th century AD used Chinese in formal education, but not in their day-to-day -day lives. The inscription known as BM28825 is much more damaged than BM45642, but reveals more details into Ashurbanipal's thoughts on scholarship and how the library of Nineveh was created. To Ashurbanipal of everything, Lord of, educated in arts of skill, whom Marduk, the twisted, who hold to the true path, lover of, wise king, expert and learned, king of Assyria, who has lavished riches on the great Lord Marduk in Isangil, who has renewed the rites and ordinances, who has established the regular offerings of the gods, who has provided abundantly for the temple of Babylon, the king our lord who, like me, is faithfully bowed to the scribal art, who wrote to us thus. These twelve scholars have, stored in their minds like goods piled in a magazine, that is, they know off by heart, the entire corpus of scribal learning that they have read and collated, and they have toiled day and night, writing it all down. They shall not shirk from the property of the great Lord Marduk, my lord, and all the houses. My dear brother, who seventy-two writing boards of Sisu wood from the house or temple. Thanks to Ashur Banipal's efforts, Nineveh was transformed into not only just the most ostentatious city in Mesopotamia, but also the center of knowledge and learning. Ashur Banipal's reign was the last period of Nineveh's greatness, because after him Nineveh and the Assyrian Empire itself was living on borrowed time. The Last Assyrian Kings and Nineveh After Ashur Banipal died, his successors were unable to hold the empire that he worked so hard to build. The rule of Ashur Banipal's heir, Ashur Etil Ilani, 627-623 BC, was contested by some members of the nobility, and at some point also by a royal eunuch named Sin Shamlishir. Precise date of his rule is unknown. The last Assyrian king to rule from Nineveh was Ashur Banipal's son, Sin Shar Ishkun, 622 to 612 BC, but another Assyrian named Ashur Ubalit II, 611 to 608 BC, ruled the remaining sliver of Assyria before the Assyrians were extinguished from the historical record by the Medes and Neo-Babylonians around 608 BC. With so much chaos surrounding the royal succession and the impending doom posed by the combined forces of the Neo-Babylonians and Medes, aggrandizement programs at Nineveh were neglected by the last three Assyrian kings for the most part. There are no extant primary sources that relate any building activities by Ashur Etil Ilani at Nineveh, but there are both cuneiform texts and comments by classical historians that attest to the fact that Sin Shar Ishkun did not abandon Nineveh. A number of fragmentary cuneiform inscriptions have been discovered that indicate Sin Shar Ishkun at least attempted to carry on his predecessor's tradition of preserving the temples and palaces of Nineveh. One inscription reads, let some future prince, when that temple shall fall to ruins and become old, restore its ruins. Let him look upon the memorial with my name inscribed thereon. Let him anoint it with oil, offer sacrifices, and return it to its place. 
then Nabu and Tashmitam will hear his prayers. But whoever destroys my written name does not set it up beside his written name. May Nabu and Tashmitam not stand at his side. May they not hear his prayers. With an evil curse may they curse him. His seed may they destroy from the land. The tone of Sinshar Ishkun's text is decidedly darker and more negative than that of his successors. There are no detailed explanations of expansive building projects, only that the king inscribed his name on a monument for all to see. The passage almost seems to convey a sense of desperation and insecurity. Perhaps the king knew what the fate of his empire was. Based on this fragmentary inscription, it is difficult to assess the level of wealth at Nineveh during the reign of Sinshar Ishkun, but a passage from the classical historian Herodotus relates that the city may still have been rich. One passage relates how thieves tunneled into the royal palace at Nineveh in order to steal the wealth of Sinshar Ishkun, referred to as Sardanapalus by classical writers. Herodotus wrote, I remembered the story of a similar thing that happened at Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. King Sardanapalus had a vast treasure, which he kept in a strong room underground, and some thieves plotted to steal it. They tunneled a passage to the strong room from the house where they lived, making as good a guess as possible at the distance and direction, and every night dumped the sail they took out into the Tigris, which flows past the city, until their purpose was achieved. Although some of the details of Herodotus's account should be considered with a skeptical eye, the fact that the heist of the treasure took the thief so long points toward Nineveh still being a wealthy city on the eve of its collapse. The Fall of Nineveh Perhaps just as important as the construction and building projects were to Nineveh's history was that of its precipitous decline. No city's decline in the ancient world was better documented than Nineveh's, as Biblical, Classical Greek, and Babylonian sources all attest to the expeditious destruction of the once great city. Nineveh's quick death is probably why it was immortalized in so many sources. Most ancient cities suffered damage to certain sections when foreign invaders conquered, but were often rebuilt and allowed to continue, sometimes with an equally large or larger role in the new ruler's plans. Nineveh was different in this respect, and in some ways served as a warning to later peoples, especially the Hebrews and Greeks, as to what can happen if a people becomes too bloodthirsty and oppressive. The sources vary on the details of Nineveh's destruction, but most modern scholars believe that Sinshar Ishkun perished along with his city, and then Ashur Ubalit II made the last stand of the Assyrian people in the Syrian city of Haran. The cuneiform source for the fall of Nineveh comes from a section of the so-called Babylonian Chronicle that is now housed in the British Museum in London, BM 21901. The text relates in detail how the first Neo-Babylonian king, Nabu Polassar, 626-605 BC, mustered an army in Babylon in 616 BC and immediately marched north into Assyria. The chronicle reads, The tenth year of Nabu Polassar, in the month of Er, he mustered the army of Akkad and marched along the bank of the Euphrates. The Suhians and the Hindonians did not do battle against him, but placed their tribute before him. In the month of Ab, the army of Assyria prepared for battle in Gablini, and Nabor Polisar went up against them. On the twelfth day of the month Ab, he did battle against the army of Assyria, and the army of Assyria retreated before him. He inflicted a major defeat upon Assyria and plundered them extensively. The chronicle then explains that an ebb in the hostilities took place, which was then broken by the Assyrians and their Egyptian allies who struck south from Nineveh into the Babylonia region, referred to in the text as Akkad. In the month of Tishri, the army of Egypt and the army of Assyria went after the king of Akkad as far as Gablini, but they did not overtake the king of Akkad, so they withdrew. In the month Adar, the army of Assyria and the army of Akkad did battle against one another at Mandanu, a suburb of Arapu, and the army of Assyria retreated before the army of Akkad. They, the army of Akkad, inflicted a major defeat upon them, the Assyrian army, and drove them back to the Zab River. The Assyrian counteroffensive proved to be their last gasp, though, because Nabopolassar and his army regrouped, marched north, and were joined by an army of Medes that had marched on Assyria from the east. Nineveh became the victim of a classic pincer movement. 
The chronicle relates the events. Instead, the army of the king of Akkad, which had been stationed in the fortress, inflicted a major defeat upon Assyria. The king of Assyria and his army turned and went home. In the month of Maheshvan, the Medes went down to Arapu, and in the twelfth year, in the month Ab, the Medes, after they had marched against Nineveh, hastened, and they captured Tabisu, a city in the district of Nineveh. From the month Sivan until the month Ab, for three months, they subjected the city to a heavy siege. In the month of Ab, they inflicted a major defeat upon a great people. At that time, Sinchar Ishkun, king of Assyria, died. They carried off the vast booty of the city and the temple, and turned the city into a ruined heap. The chronicle relates important information concerning the death of Sinchar Ishkun and the long siege of Nineveh, but leaves out important facts pertaining to what precipitated the war itself, or how the king died. The chronicle is also not an objective source, as it relates the events from the perspective of Babylon, and paints the Assyrians as inherently bad. The classical Greek and Roman historians provide a bit more information concerning the fall of Nineveh, and offer the events from the Mede perspective. The 5th century BC Greek historian Herodotus is known for relating some fantastic tales, incorrect statements, and garbled chronologies in his work The Histories, but his narratives of what was at the time more recent history are fairly accurate. Herodotus recounts the fall of Nineveh from the perspective of the Medes, and gives reasons for the war, as well as a fairly accurate length for the Neo-Assyrian period. The historian wrote, The Assyrians had been masters of Upper Asia over a period of 520 years, when the Medes set the example of revolt from their authority. They took arms in the cause of liberty, and fought with such gallantry that they shook off the Assyrian yoke, and became a free people. Their lead was followed by other nations within the Assyrian Empire until every people in that part of the continent had won its independence. Herodotus's account corroborates the siege of Nineveh as told in the Babylonian Chronicle, although the Greek historian does not mention a length for the siege, and as stated before, recounts the experience from the Medes' perspective, but then diverges significantly. The Greek historian mentions that the Medes were temporarily distracted from their siege of Nineveh by the nomadic Scythian people. He wrote, The first act of his reign was to march against Nineveh at the head of all his subject nations, with the object of destroying the town and avenging his father. He fought a successful battle against the Assyrians, but while he was besieging the town, he was attacked by a large Scythian army. At last, Cyaxares and the Medes invited the greater number of them to a banquet, at which they made them drunk and murdered them, and in this way recovered their former power and dominion. They captured Nineveh, the story of the capture I will relate in another place, and subdued the Assyrians, all except the territory belonging to Babylon. Unfortunately, the detailed account of Nineveh's capture is never related in any other section of the histories, as Herodotus promised, but the entire account does corroborate the Babylonian chronicle and vice versa. It is unknown if the Scythians were involved in the war or if Herodotus simply inserted them as a literary trope. The mention of the Scythians may also have been another Herodotian anachronism because they played a bigger role in the history of the Near East during his lifetime than in the late 7th century BC. The final possibility is that the Scythians or some other nomadic or semi-nomadic tribe were employed by the Assyrians as mercenaries against the Medes, and Herodotus simply called them Scythians, who again were more familiar to the historian. Although Herodotus's account is based primarily on historical facts, there does appear to be some use of the literary motifs, or topoi, of which most ancient writers, historians included, were quite fond. The use of literary motifs in the recounting of the fall of Nineveh is most apparent in the work of another well-known Greek historian. The 1st century BC Greek historian Diodorus wrote a much more extensive history of the known world, which is known to the modern world as the Library of History. Diodorus claimed to have consulted oral sources, usually priests and other scribes, as well as a large collection of written materials, usually the works of previous historians whose writings are now lost. Possibly owing to better source material, Diodorus's account of the fall of Nineveh is the most detailed, but also probably full of more literary topoi. According to Diodorus, Sinsharishkun, Sardanapalus, like a true captain, went down with the sinking ship that was Nineveh. Diodorus wrote, 
Sardanapalus, realizing that his entire kingdom was in the greatest danger, sent his three sons and two daughters, together with much of his treasure, to Paphlagonia, to the governor Cotter, who was the most loyal of his subjects, while he himself, dispatching letter carriers to all his subjects, summoned forces and made preparations for the siege. No enemy will ever take Ninus by storm, unless the river shall first become the city's enemy. It is unknown if Sinsharishkun did indeed send his progeny into exile, since the Assyrian royal line ended with Ashur Ubalit II, but it seems like the move would have been reasonable, with two armies converging on the city. The passage that follows describes how the enemy armies were eventually able to enter Nineveh, referred to as Ninus, which ultimately led to the death of Sinsharishkun. It states, Consequently, the siege dragged on, and for two years they pressed their attack, making assaults on the walls and preventing the inhabitants of the city from going into the country. But in the third year, after there had been heavy and continuous rains, it came to pass that the Euphrates, running very full, both inundated a portion of the city and broke down the walls for a distance of twenty stades. At this the king, believing that the oracle had been fulfilled, and that the river had plainly become the city's enemy, he built an enormous pyre in his palace, heaped upon it all his gold and silver, as well as every article of the royal wardrobe, and then, shutting his concubines and eunuchs in the room which had been built in the middle of the pyre, he consigned both them and himself and his palace to the flames. The rebels, on learning of the death of Sardanapalus, took the city by forcing an entrance where the wall had fallen, and clothing Arbaces in the royal garb saluting him as king, and put in his hands the supreme authority. A number of interesting and historically important points are raised in this passage. First, Diodorus gives two years for the length of Nineveh's siege, while the Babylon Chronicle states that the feat only took three months. In the ancient world, either length of time was possible. Homer wrote that Troy was finally reduced after a ten-year siege which by all accounts was a well-defended city that sat atop a citadel much like Nineveh. In all likelihood, the length of the siege was somewhere between the two. The second point of interest from the passage is the description of Sinsharishkun's death, which Diodorus describes as a sati-type immolation episode. Since this part of the passage cannot be corroborated, it is impossible to say at this point if it is based on fact or a literary topos in the vein of a Greek tragedy. The final portion of the passage of importance is the mention of the Euphrates River flooding Nineveh. Although the Kossa River was a tributary of the Tigris River, Nineveh was clearly located somewhere near the Euphrates River. Diodorus's account may simply be an error on his part that was the result of a bad source. Since he never visited the ruins of Nineveh, his source, whether oral or a previous written source, may have been incorrect concerning the geography of Nineveh. On the other hand, the apparent error may have been the result of a literary topos that was passed to the Greek historian from a Mesopotamian source. Mark van der Meerup believes that the Kossa River may have been intentionally flooded by the Babylonians after they took Nineveh, in revenge for Sennacherib's flooding of Babylon decades earlier. The idea of Nineveh being flooded by the Euphrates River then became a literary topos related by Babylonian scribes in juxtaposition to Sennacherib's flooding of their city by the river. One final ancient source describes the fall of Nineveh in more mysterious terms, but seems to corroborate the idea of the city being flooded. Among the many prophets of the Old Testament, Nahum is one of the least known, perhaps because his book is one of the shortest. The focus of the short book is the many reasons why God doomed Nineveh, which essentially stems from the fact that the Assyrians under Sargon II 721 to 705 BCE, took the ten northern tribes of Israel into captivity. The words of the prophet state, The gates of the rivers shall be opened, and the palace shall be dissolved, and Huzab shall be led away captive, she shall be brought up, and her maids shall lead her as with the voice of doves, tabering upon their breasts. But Nineveh is of old, like a pool of water, yet they shall flee away, Stand, stand, shall they cry, but none shall look back. Take ye the spoil of silver, take the spoil of gold, for there is none end of the store and glory out of all the pleasant furniture. She is empty and void and waste, and the heart melteth and the knees smite together, 
and much pain is in all loins, and the faces of them all gather blackness. Although the passage is heavily couched in esoteric biblical jargon, Nineveh's destruction by water is clear, with two disparate primary sources attributing a flood to Nineveh's destruction, it appears safe to assume that torrential waters played some role in the city's doom. Once the Babylonians and Medes overran Nineveh, they destroyed the palaces and temples, and apparently made the city unlivable for a period of time. But, like all great cities, Nineveh had a life force that could not be easily extinguished. Nineveh in Later Periods Although the end of the Assyrian Empire also meant the end of ancient Assyrian culture in the Near East, and the dominance of Nineveh as an urban center, the locals rebuilt the site and continued to use it for several centuries. Post-Assyrian historical records and archaeological excavations have revealed that Nineveh continued to be an important trade center, a well-known landmark for military campaigns, and a religious center for the later Christian and Islamic faiths. A combination of its location near the Tigris River and its historical cachet contributed to Nineveh's continued existence, despite its desolation at the hands of the Babylonians and Medes. Many of the post-Assyrian historical accounts of Nineveh depict it primarily as a landmark that campaigning armies used to distinguish where they were in the vast reaches of Mesopotamia. One of the earliest post-Assyrian historical accounts that mentioned Nineveh was related by Herodotus. In the account, the Persian king Darius I, 521 to 486 BC, was sidetracked from his invasion of Greece in 499 BC when Babylon revolted. One of Darius I's generals, Zopyrus, used guile to trick the Babylonians and regain the city for the Persians. The account states, I will go as I am to the city walls, pretending to be a deserter, and I will tell them that it was you who caused my misery. They will believe me readily enough, and they will put their troops under my command. Now for your part, wait till the tenth day after I enter the town, and then station by the gates of Semiramis, a detachment of a thousand men, whose loss will not worry you. Then, seven days later, send two thousand men to the Nineveh gates, and twenty days after that, another four thousand to the Chaldean gates. The passage is a bit confusing, as the situation involves the Persians' plan to retake Babylon, so the mention of the Nineveh gates may either be anachronistic or a case where Herodotus mixed elements from the two cities. Since there was no known Nineveh gates in ancient Babylon, one may be led to believe that the passage may refer to both cities, but J. E. Reed argues that the mention of Nineveh here is dubious, and more likely a mistake on Herodotus's part. The idea that Herodotus confused and mixed the two cities is a strong possibility when one considers the next post-Assyrian classical account of Nineveh. In 401 BC, the Greek general Xenophon, who was a hero for Sparta in the Peloponnesian War, led 10,000 Greek mercenaries into Mesopotamia in an effort to topple the Persian king Artaxerxes II, 404 to 359 BC, from the throne and replace him with his brother Cyrus. After Cyrus was killed in battle, the Greeks were forced to march back home through hundreds of miles of enemy territory. The account was masterfully retold by Xenophon in the Anabasis, which is often translated into English as the Persian Expedition. The book is essentially a military history, but also relates ample background on the inhabitants of Mesopotamia and the region's geography. In one passage, Xenophon and the Greeks took temporary refuge at Nineveh which they knew by the name Mespila. Xenophon wrote, From here a day's march of eighteen miles brought them to a large, undefended fortification near a city called Mespila, which was once inhabited by the Medes. The base of this fortification was made of polished stone, in which there were many shells. It was fifty feet broad and fifty feet high. On top of it was built a brick wall fifty feet in breadth and a hundred feet high. The perimeter of the fortification was 18 miles. Medea, the king's wife, is supposed to have taken refuge here at the time when the Medes lost their empire to the Persians, and the king of the Persians, when he besieged the city, could not take it, either by the passing of time or by assault. Zeus, however, drove the inhabitants out of their wits with a thunderstorm, and so the city was taken. The passage is a bit confusing and ironically incorrectly identifies the Assyrians as the Medes 
The confusion by Xenophon, though, is overshadowed by a reoccurring theme that was discussed above, the destruction of Nineveh by nature. Both Diodorus and Nahum attributed floods and storms to Nineveh's destruction, and it appears Xenophon also did. The general and military historian may have been the source for Diodorus's account, but unfortunately he, like most other Greek historians, rarely cited his written sources. Diodorus was also responsible for another post-Assyrian mention of Nineveh in the historical record. Diodorus's final mention of Nineveh in the Library of History relates to the Persian king Darius III, 335-331 BC, and his preparations to meet Alexander the Great's army at the Battle of Arbela, Gorgamela, in 331 BC. Darius III chose the region of Nineveh because it was strategically conducive to the Persians' large force. All of the force the king adorned with shining armor and with brilliant commanders. As he marched out of Babylon, he had with him 800,000 infantry and no less than 200,000 cavalry. He kept the Tigris on the right of his route and the Euphrates on the left and proceeded through a rich country capable of furnishing ample fodder for the animals and food enough for so many soldiers. He had in mind to deploy for battle in the vicinity of Nineveh, since the plains there were well suited to his purpose, and afforded ample manoeuvre room for the huge forces at his disposal. Pitching camp at a village named Arbella, he drilled his troops daily and made them well disciplined by continued training and practice. He was most concerned, lest some confusion should arise in the battle from the numerous peoples assembled who differed in speech. The passage is important because it is the last mention of Nineveh by a major classical historian, and although it mentioned the plains near the city, there was no mention of crops. It seems as though by 331 BC the population of Nineveh was still quite small, and the fertile cropland that fed the city in the Neo-Assyrian period indeed sat fallow. After Alexander left the region in victory, Nineveh began to gradually sink into obscurity and became just another town in the region. A number of various objects excavated at Nineveh, dated from between the Median and Islamic periods, attests to the continued inhabitation of Nineveh over the last 2,000 years. The city became part of the province of Adiabene under the Seleucid and Parthian dynasties, and retained some importance due to its location on the river and the continued existence of its markets. Despite considerable material culture artifacts being discovered there, the nature of the population remains somewhat enigmatic. For instance, a number of Parthian period coins have been excavated in Nineveh, along with some small Greek statues, but it is uncertain if the population during these periods spoke Greek, Syriac, or Persian. Eventually, the population, like those in all the surrounding regions, adopted Aramaic as the primary spoken language. Knowledge of the political situation in post-Seleucid Nineveh is also somewhat problematic. The Parthian king Mithridates I conquered the region around 141 BC, and Nineveh was later named as an important city captured by Tigranes I of Armenia sometime between 90 and 80 BC. But being so close to Armenia, the city changed hands on numerous occasions between the Parthians and Romans. Later, under the Sassanid dynasty, Nineveh was the seat of the Jacobite and Nestorian bishoprics, and so exercised a renewed theological influence on the region. But by that time, its apex of power under the later Neo-Assyrian kings was forgotten by most people. In later Islamic dynasties, the city of Mosul, which was located on the opposite side of the Tigris River, became an important military center that ultimately proved to be the final nail in Nineveh's coffin. Archaeological Investigations at Nimrud Austin Henry Layard was the first to excavate at Nimrud, but even before he came, the site had already been gaining attention. In 1816, James Silk Buckingham visited the site, which he called Nimrod Tup, and noted that it likely contained ancient ruins. In 1821, Claudius James Rich of the East India Company visited the site, noted the remains of the ziggurat, and collected inscribed brick fragments from the surface. In 1844, missionary Reverend James Fletcher visited the site and dug for inscribed bricks. 
That same year, British missionary George Badger surveyed the site and suggested to Sir Stratford Canning that the site should be excavated. Canning would fund Layard's excavation the following year. Layard came to the Near East in 1839 and began travelling throughout the area. In 1845, he was invited by Paul Emil Botter to join the excavation of the Koyunjik Mound opposite Mosul but Layard instead decided to begin his own excavation of the Nimrud Mound. He began excavations that year, and at first he believed he had found the ancient city of Nineveh, which, somewhat ironically, was actually at the Koyunjuk Mound. Tablets at the site later confirmed it to be ancient Kalhu, the neo-Assyrian capital today known as Nimrud. Layard worked at the site from 1845 to 1847, and then again from 1849 to 1851. The first excavation was funded by Sir Stratford Canning, but after seeing the potential of the site, the excavation was then funded by the trustees of the British Museum. As a result, many of the site's most famous artefacts are in the British Museum today. Layard excavated the state apartments of the Northwest Palace, south of the main entrance, but due to limited funding, he could not completely excavate many of the rooms. Instead, he trenched around the walls. From these excavations, he found stone relief slabs and colossal stone gateway figures. Layard also excavated the Ninuta and Ishtar Sarat Nifi temples, as well as the central, southeast and southwest palaces. He even briefly excavated at the Ziggurat and Fort Shalmaneser. Since Layard's first excavations, Nimrud has become one of the best explored ancient sites in the region. W. K. Loftus excavated the Central Palace area, the Southeast and Southwest Palaces, the Nabu Temple, and the Burnt Palace on behalf of the Assyrian Excavation Fund in 1854-1855. In the Burnt Palace, he found a collection of ivories and a grave dating to the early or mid-2nd millennium BC. From 1877 to 1879, Hormud Rassam worked at Nimrud on behalf of the trustees of the British Museum. Rassam had worked with Layard during his original excavations 30 years prior, and thus knew the site well. During this time, Rassam worked in the Nabu Temple, in the southeast and central palace areas, and discovered the Kidmuri Temple northeast of the northwest palace. After Rassam, excavation of Nimrud did not pick up again until 1949, when Max Malawan began work at the site on behalf of the British School of Archaeology in Iraq. This excavation continued at Nimrud until 1963, and Malawan remained the director of the excavation until David Oates took over in 1958. The last season, in 1963, was directed by Geoffrey Orchard. The excavation under these three directors explored many aspects of the site, including the Nunuta Temple, the 1950 building, the Governor's Palace, the Nabu Temple, the Burnt Palace, the Southeast Palace, the Town Hall, and Fort Shalmaneser. During this time, the Iraq Department of Antiquities had begun restoration work in Nimrud in 1956. They did more restoration work in 1959-1960 and in 1969 began doing restoration work annually, especially in the Northwest Palace and Nabu Temple. In 1974, a Polish team began excavating at the site as well. The team, led by Janusz Mejorzynski, worked at the site until 1976. They focused on the central building and the central palace of Tiglath Pilisa III. An Italian team from Turin took over this work from 1987 to 1989, led by Paolo Fiorina. They explored the walls separating the fort compound from the rest of the city, and its junction with the main city wall, along with several storerooms in the southwest sector. In 1989, a team from the British Museum, led by John Curtis and Dominique Collin, worked at the site focusing on the area of Fort Shalmaneser. An Iraqi team also worked to excavate the site between 1985 and 2002. The team worked continuously from 1985 to 1993, but there was a gap between 94 and 2000 due to the international embargo on Iraq at the time. Work then resumed in 2001, 
but it had to end in 2002 due to the invasion of Iraq by American-led forces. This team, led by Muzahim Mahmoud Hussein, located the royal tombs underneath the southern part of the Northwest Palace and also uncovered a previously unknown building, the Adad Nirari III Palace, located immediately south of the Northwest Palace. The Iraqi team further excavated in the Central Building Palace, the Nabu Temple, the Ishtar Temple, and the Black Temple. Designing a New Capital The site of Nimrud was occupied and settled long before any Neo-Assyrian king set foot there. Pottery sherds have been found on the surface from the Hanaf and Ubaid period dating to the period 6000 to 4500 BC. Following this, there were painted pottery sherds from the early 3rd millennium, a period sometimes called Ninevite V. This period followed the late Uruk period in northern Mesopotamia, whereas in the south, the Uruk period was followed by the Jemdet Nasser and early dynastic periods. Nimrud was already an Assyrian site before it became a Neo-Assyrian capital city. In the Middle Assyrian period, it may have been a provincial capital, and Max Malawan found evidence of Middle Assyrian occupation in the citadel and on the east side of the citadel. Archaeological remains were specifically found in TW53, room 18, and between the Temple of Nabu and the Burnt Palace. These areas were not explored further due to limited time and funding and because resources were moved to other parts of the site. During the Middle Assyrian period, Shalmaneser I likely built at Nimrud. He was thus probably the Shalmaneser mentioned by Ashurna Sirpal II as the original founder of the site. While it has been mentioned already that there is evidence of occupation before the Middle Assyrian period, it is possible that this period saw its rise from a smaller settlement to a larger town or city. Either way, Ashurna Sipal II associated the founding of the site with the prominent earlier king, solidifying its position as a truly Assyrian site. Seal impressions were also found, dating to earlier periods, the earliest being the 19th century BC, but these were likely heirloom seals brought to Kalhu when it became the Assyrian capital. Ashurna Sirpal II decided to make Kalhu the capital of the Assyrian Empire. He reigned from 883 to 859 BC, but Kalhu would remain the Assyrian capital until the reign of Sargon, a century and a half later. When he arrived, there were already important temples at the site. One of these, the Ishtar Belet Kidmuri, may have dated back to Middle Assyrian times before being rebuilt or restored by Ashurna Sirpal II. All of this has led historians to wonder why the Assyrians built a new capital. Perhaps most importantly, this move put distance between the king and the priesthood and great families at Ashur, the previous capital city of Assyria. These people had been very influential until this time, perhaps too influential for the king to be comfortable. It further brought the king closer to the influential families in the northern cities who had been able to comfortably rule their own cities beyond the king's reach. On the side of religious motivation and propaganda, a new city gave the king the role of creator, solidifying his power. The last new city founded by an Assyrian king was Kar Tukulti Ninurta, founded by Middle Assyrian king Tukulti Ninurta I. 1243-1207 BC. Kalhu was moreover an ideal location for this new capital, as it was in the middle of the Assyrian Triangle, formed by Ashur, Nineveh, and Arbela. Thus, while Ashur had always been the traditional capital, it was too far south to be a central location. Moving the capital to Kalhu solved the administrative problem of keeping control of a larger area, and thus dealing with influential families in the empire that were mentioned before. Ashurna Sipal II ruled at a time when the Assyrian Empire was still forming, though the Neo-Assyrian period, by today's chronologies, had already begun before his reign. During the Middle Assyrian period, the Assyrian kings had power over an extended area, but this period was followed by a bit of a dark age.
The rise of the Neo-Assyrian Empire can be broken into two phases. The first includes the period from the reign of Ashur-dan II to the reign of Tukulti Ninurta II. During this period, Assyria slowly began reconquering its lost territories. In the second phase, beginning under Ashur-nasirpal II, the capital moved to Nimrud in central Assyria. During his reign, and the reign of his son, Shalmaneser III, Assyria became the predominant political power in the area. In order to transform the city into a larger capital city, Ashur-nasirpal had to undertake massive building projects. To irrigate the region and provide water for the new larger population, he dug a canal from the upper Zab. He also built massive walls around the city. Ashur-nasirpal described his renovations of the city in the banquet steel found at the site. In the steel, he described building an extravagant palace and gardens, restoring temples, and rejuvenating the surrounding area. He also described celebrating the new capital with a lavish feast and banquet, hence the name, where he claimed to have served nearly 70,000 people with a spectacular amount of food. This was likely an exaggeration in numbers, but the stella may commemorate an actual historical event, albeit one likely smaller than described. The citadel was surrounded by a wall made of mud brick. On the west side, facing the Tigris floodplain, the wall was faced with stone blocks. This wall is sometimes called the Key Wall. The largest building on the citadel was the Northwest Palace, which was built by Ashunasirpal. But farther south, there were palaces built by Shalmaneser III, Tiglath Pelisa III, and Esar Haddon. Excavations in the 1990s further identified a new palace immediately south of the Northwest Palace, constructed by Adad Nirari III. The area now identified as this palace was excavated by Layard, but he didn't recognize it as a new palace. Instead, he called this area the Upper Chambers, after discovering a large hall and three small chambers. Julian Reed suggested that this suite of rooms may have been built by Adad Nirari for his mother, Samu Ramat. A ziggurat was built at the northwest corner of the citadel, just north of the northwest palace. The structure had a mud brick core and a baked brick face, with a stone retaining wall below. A temple to Ninuta was located between the ziggurat and the northwest palace. The temple was built by Ashur Nasipal and included a pair of lamasu at one entrance. It is unclear how the ziggurat and the temple to Ninuta are connected, but the ziggurat also appears to have been dedicated to the god Ninuta. Some have suggested that a confusion between the god Ninuta, a warlike god, and the biblical Nimrod may have led to the modern name of Nimrod for the site, because Ninuta was clearly the main god of ancient Kalhu. The Ninuta temple was decorated with reliefs and painted walls. The most interesting part of these decorations was the lengthy inscriptions included with them, which were some of the longest Assyrian royal inscriptions known from any reign. Inside the temple, a recess at the end of the sanctuary included a massive inscribed alabaster slab holding 325 lines of text, with another three columns of text on the back. A large stella was placed outside the northern entrance to the Ninuta temple, showing Ashur Nasipal and the symbols of major gods. The inscription on this stella is sometimes called the Great Monolith Inscription and included 568 lines of text. In front of the stella was a limestone altar. A stella of Shamshi Adad V was originally placed in this area as well, according to its inscription but it was discovered by excavators in the Nabu temple. Inside the Ninuta temple, a large cache of hundreds of beads was found under the floor, along with over 20 cylinder seals. Some of these seals were heirloom seals, which were already antiques in the time that the temple was built. The room under which this cache was found was likely blocked off when the temple was constructed, so its function is unclear. It may have been a repository for votive or foundation offerings. In this area was also the temple to Ishtar Sarat Nifi. This temple had colossal lions at the entrance, and on either side of the door stood two altars. The facade was decorated with glazed bricks. 
Inside the temple was a limestone statue of Ashur Nasipal II on a reddish stone base. A final temple in this part of the citadel was a temple to Ishtar Kidmuri. This temple is southeast of the temple of Ishtar Saratnifi. Ashur Banipal's inscriptions suggest that a temple to Ishtar Kidmuri had already existed at the site, but that he had renovated it while rebuilding the city. The interior of the building was decorated with glazed wall plaques. There was originally a well associated with this temple, but its location is unknown. Inscribed bricks pertaining to be from this well were found in the northwest palace. In the northeast corner of the citadel were the TW53 houses. These were the only non-palatial residences that have been investigated at Nimrud, and the only glimpse researchers have into the non-royal population of the city at this time. Maloan excavated a trench in the northeastern part of the mound in 1949, attempting to figure out what was in this area of the citadel near the wall. He found a group of houses and returned to excavating them in 1953, and the houses had a sequence of archaeological levels with in situ pottery and tablets. The sequence ran all the way from the Middle Assyrian period up to the Neo-Babylonian or Achaemenid and Hellenistic periods. These houses were abutting directly onto the town wall on the east. None of the houses' entrances was identified, but they must have opened onto a street on their western sides. Malawan had identified six houses, but Oates and Oates argue that there are actually only two larger residences. One of these houses belonged to Shamash Sharu Usur, who was a eunuch, a court official, a merchant, a landowner, and a moneylender. He had an unusually long life for the period, with records of his business transactions spanning half a century. South of these houses was the 1950 building, which was decorated with geometric wall paintings common in lesser palaces, such as the Governor's Palace. It is unknown when this was built, since the bricks inscribed with the name of Shalmaneser III in the courtyard may have been reused. A few tablets were found, but none of these could be dated. In one of the storage magazines, a burial was found containing two equids, but this too could not be dated. East of the area explored in the 1950 building, excavators dug a deep trench or a sounding where they found burnt material of the Middle Assyrian period. Even deeper, the excavators found pottery dating to the second millennium BC, which was painted with red stripes. In the middle of the citadel was the so-called central building and the central palace of Tiglath Pileser III. The central building was built by Asuna Sirpal II. The facade of this building faced south and included at least four colossi and orthostats. Near the facade were the famous black obelisk of Shalmaneser III, the Rasam obelisk, and an unfinished statue. The black obelisk shows tribute being brought to Shalmaneser from throughout the ancient Near East, and most famously, the obelisk shows the biblical king Jehu submitting to the king. Other tributes being brought to the king include horses from northwest Iran and exotic animals from Egypt. The Rasam obelisk is a damaged black obelisk of Ashur Nasipal II. Southwest of the central building was discovered a pair of colossal winged bulls, referred to as the center bulls, and dating to the time of Shalmaneser III. These bulls likely belong to the entrance of another palatial building. It is generally thought that the central building was a temple built by Asuna Sipal II. This idea is supported by the presence of the obelisks near the façade but it is unclear why several rooms had large amounts of pottery grouped according to shape. The central palace of Tiglath Pileser III was described by the king who built it as the area of which was to be greater than that of the earlier palaces of my fathers. Unfortunately, most of this palace has been destroyed, and even its dimensions are not fully known. Part of this damage was due to Esarhaddon plundering the stone reliefs for his own new palace in the southwest corner of the Tell. Layard found a collection of about 100 carved orthostats, stacked and ready to be moved to the new palace. It seems that Esarhaddon never finished constructing his palace, 
likely because it was burned down before it was finished. East of the central palace was the governor's palace. This was where the governor of Kalhu lived, while the city was a provincial center in the 8th century BC, hence the current name for the building. The building was originally called the 1949 building. It was likely built by Shalmaneser III due to inscribed bricks, but some have suggested that these were used for the palace by Adad Nirari III after Shalmaneser III made the bricks for the construction of the ziggurat. This palace included an archive of administrative tablets, along with a large collection of cups, plates and bottles of the finest palace ware. The excavators nicknamed this collection the Governor's Dinner Service. South of the Governor's Palace were the Burnt Palace and the Nabu Temple. The Burnt Palace was originally a 9th century building, but archaeological evidence shows that it was rebuilt twice. The first time was likely during the reign of Adad Nirari III. The second time it was rebuilt was by Sargon, who may have split his time between the Burnt Palace and the Northwest Palace before moving the capital to Khorsabad. The reception room likely had its decoration replaced in the latest phase of palace use, probably in the time of Asur Etel Ilani. After this period, there were further levels on top of squatter levels, leveling perhaps during the Achaemenid period and Hellenistic kilns. Inside this palace was found a large collection of ivories, some of which are today known as the Loftus Ivories in honor of their discoverer. These were all in the final version of the palace when the palace was burnt down, earning it the name it is called today. The burning of this palace probably occurred at the same time as the sack of the site in 612 BC by the Medes, as part of their campaign against the Assyrian Empire. In addition to the ivories, a large amount of glass was also found, in addition to a collection of cuneiform letters. While the burnt palace was originally built in the 9th century, there was already something in this area before then. Excavators found earlier phases belonging to the Middle Assyrian period, late 2nd millennium BC. However, the palace did not attain its monumentality until the refounding of the city by Ashur Nasipal II. It was during this restructuring of the city that the layout of this entire area was completely changed so that a new north-south oriented street passed between the Nabu Temple and the Burnt Palace. The Nabu Temple was founded by Ashurna Sirpal, but a great deal of the construction was actually finished during the reign of Adad Nirari III. Before the recent destruction of the site, this temple had been restored by the Directorate General of Antiquities. Along with the Northwest Palace, it was one of the main attractions at the site for tourists. The Nabu Temple complex is more commonly known as the Izida, which was a name adopted by the Assyrians from Nabu's main temple in Borsippa, his cult center. The entrance to the Nabu Temple is commonly referred to as the Fish Gate, due to the presence of headless limestone mermen with scaly bodies and fins on either side of the entrance. One text from Fort Shalmaneser suggests that these mermen, or fishmen, were originally covered in gold leaf. Several statues were found inside or near the temple. Two of these dated to the reign of Adad Nirari III, dedicated by the governor to the temple, and show attendant gods serving Nabu. These originally stood on either side of the entrance to Nabu's antechamber facing east. Two other statues were found nearby, facing each other with the entrance between them, each holding offering trays. A library of tablets was found here, including the vassal treaties of S.R. Haddon. Other than the state archives, which were later moved to the new capital, and the archives of the palace, and the city administration of Kalhu, the only other library was here at the temple of Nabu. Nabu was the divine patron of scribes, so it stands to reason that literary and scholarly texts would be stored in his temple. Furthermore, during this period, kings still left the responsibility of preserving scholarly knowledge to the temples and private scribes. Also found in the temple was a stella of Shamsi Adad V and incised ivory plaques. At the south end of the citadel was the southwest palace, the southeast palace, 
and Fort Charmanisa. The Southwest Palace was built by S. R. Hatton in the southwest corner of the Citadel Mound. S. R. Hatton reused reliefs of Ashurna Sipal II and Tiglath Palisa III to decorate this building, as evidenced by the sculptured slabs found stacked in the Central Palace, ready for reuse in the Southwest Palace. These slabs may have been intended to be recarved or left plain, as reliefs found in the Southwest Palace seem to have been shaved down. Not much is known of the original layout or plan of this palace. It is known that the Southwest Palace had been partially destroyed by a large fire, which possibly halted its construction. The building was never completed. The Southeast Palace was originally built by Shalmaneser III, but later restored, possibly by Ashur Etel Ilani. The term Southeast Palace has actually been used to describe several different buildings at the site, including the Ezida and the Burnt Palace, but now is exclusively used for the building, also sometimes called the Assyrian Building, A.B. This building is south of the Nabu Temple and was found beneath Hellenistic tombs in the southeast corner of the Tell. The term Assyrian Building A.B. has been used to differentiate the building from the Hellenistic material in the same area. The building contained a characteristic throne room suite, and therefore had some official function. It is not clear for whom this palace was built, but it may have been for a member of the royal family, perhaps the crown prince. The latest phase of the building includes a series of small clay-lined boxes covered with single bricks placed on either side of doorways and in the corners of rooms. These are similar to foundation deposits found in the burnt palace, which date to the reign of Adad Nirari III. Lamu figures were also found, but there were no Apkalu figures, or multi-figure boxes, as there had been in the Burnt Palace. The small size of the covering bricks suggests a late 7th century BCE date for these deposits. Inscribed examples from elsewhere on the mound date to the reign of Ashur Etel Ilani, 631-627 BC. The building known as Fort Shalmaneser was located in the southeast corner of the city. The original Akkadian term was Ekal Masarti, which has been variously translated as Inventory Palace, Review Palace, or Arsenal. It was built by Shalmaneser III, but later restored by S. R. Haddon. The building is surrounded by a walled enclosure. S. R. Haddon built stone walls with a back gate in the south. Inside there are storerooms, barracks, state apartments, and courtyards. This building was the focus of excavations from 1958 to 1963, and so much of the original layout and plan of the building is known. The southern part of the building included throne room suites, treasuries, and residence chambers. There was even an area which were possibly for the Queen's chambers, as these resembled the layout of rooms in the domestic area of the Northwest Palace. Inside the throne room, Excavators found a throne base of Shamanese III carved with scenes of tribute being brought to the king. Ivories were found in rooms SW7, SW12, SW37, NW15, and NW21. Bronze furniture was found in room NE26. Tablets were found throughout the building, including wine ration lists. Fort Shalmaneser was the centre of a larger administrative establishment. To the north and west were large empty spaces, likely for training and parades. Past this open space were likely granaries, stables, and other large structures. These were all part of the same establishment, but did not require as much security as the area inside the fort. The Northwest Palace the most famous building in the city of Kalhu is the Northwest Palace, which was erected by Ashuna Sirpal and had been fantastically preserved. The palace is about 600 feet from north to south and 420 feet from east to west, making it one of the most impressive palaces of ancient Mesopotamia, especially with the monumental gate figures and large stone reliefs. The Northwest Palace remained in use until the sack of Nimrud in 612 BC. Asunasipal II, Shalmaneser III, and Shamshi Adad V 
all used this palace as their primary residence. Adat Nirari III and Tiglath Pileser III built their own palaces nearby, but the Northwest Palace also continued to be used. Royal burials from these periods were found within the Northwest Palace, and Sargon would also continue to use the Northwest Palace, using the building as a model for his new capital at Khosabad. The main gateways to the palace were flanked by colossal stone figures of human-headed lions, or bulls with bird wings. Called Lamassu, they served as mythological guardians. Sculptures of these guardians, either in relief or in the round, were often placed at gateways to protect the interiors from demonic forces. Somewhat strangely, they were often carved with five legs, but it seems this was to ensure that they appear to have four legs from every angle. They also directed traffic, orienting visitors by their own direction. The North Wing held offices and storerooms, serving as the administrative area of the palace. The northern area also had the entrance courtyard, which was eventually destroyed by a ravine. The northern wall was originally thought by Malawan to be the outer southern wall of the Ziggurat Terrace, but it has now been shown to be the northern edge of the palace, with the Ziggurat Terrace being further north. On the northern side of the courtyard were offices. Included among these was a suite of five rooms, including a reception room, which seems to be a smaller scale reproduction of a typical Assyrian throne room. The reception room includes two parallel rows of stone blocks, often called tramlines, which were likely used to carry a wheeled brazier. Thus, this was probably the reception suite of an extremely important official. In these rooms were found four beautiful stone vases, one of which was a Phoenician vessel of Egyptian alabaster with a pseudo-hieroglyphic inscription. Next to the suite of rooms were areas for oil storage and a wine cellar. Cuneiform texts found in this area record receipts and loans of wine, grain, oil and grapes. In the same area of the palace were also scribal offices, rooms 4 and 5. Room 4 in particular included over 350 tablets and an area for storing tablets. Many of these tablets were letters to kings tiglath Pileser III and Sargon. There were also rooms with evidence of domestic activities, including grindstones, spindle whirls, and loom weights. Room 1416 had another collection of tablets, including legal documents referring to loans of barley and silver. On the east side of the courtyard was a double range of rooms. The walls of these rooms were thicker and likely taller than the rooms to the north of the courtyard. The main gate must have been on this side but had been eroded by the ravine. South of the entrance courtyard was the central area of the palace. The central block of the palace consisted of the throne room and state apartments, decorated with stone slabs, painted plaster, and glazed bricks. The southern wing of the palace held private apartments and the queen's rooms. In room AB, excavators found a large collection of bronzes. Some of these bronzes were furniture ornaments and bowls, with Syrian and Phoenician-style decoration. Also found in this room was a vase inscribed with the name of Sargon. The southern wing further included the infamous Nimrud Queen's tombs. The Northwest Palace produced numerous ivories. Found in a well in room NN in the southern part of the building, one collection of ivories included two heads of women and two ivory plaques. The two heads are known as the Mona Lisa and the Ugly Sister. The ivory plaques have traces of gold overlay, and each shows a lioness mauling a man. Ivory and wooden writing boards with wax-coated surfaces were found in the well in room AB. The well in room AJ also contained ivories, including bowls, heads of figurines, carved tusks, and pyxides, cylindrical boxes with separate lids, originally mostly used by women to hold cosmetics, trinkets, or jewelry. The reliefs from the throne room and state apartments of the Northwest Palace are arguably the most famous finds from the site of Nimrud. Many of the reliefs are today in the British Museum at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, while the great throne base inscribed for Ashur Nasipal II was in the Mosul Museum. The throne room was where the king received his subjects and foreign dignitaries. 
Thus, the design was meant to show the mighty power of the king. The walls were lined with carved bas-reliefs, depicting both historical and ritual scenes. Next to the doorways were scenes of apotropaic winged genii holding a bucket and what looks like a fir cone. This second object is referred to in the texts simply as a purifier, possibly the actual name of the object. These genii and the objects they hold are placed at entrances so as to protect the interiors from evil and purify those who enter. The external façade of the throne room had a procession of tribute-bearers, shown moving towards the western door where courtiers led them to the king. Some of these figures are even clearly shown to be foreigners, wearing clothing associated with foreign lands or accompanied by exotic creatures. Importantly, the dress depicted for these tribute-bearers matches individuals in other scenes, such as those from Bit Adini, Carchemish, and Phoenicia all of which provided elaborate tribute to Ashur Nasipal II. The doorways were also flanked by colossal winged lions or bulls. The reliefs were likely carved in situ in Nimrud, but the colossi were likely hewn at the quarry and transported to the palace. Inside the throne room, the large stone throne base was at the east end of the hall and the focal point of the room. As stated before, this space can now be seen at the Mosul Museum. In front of the throne, the floor was paved with large stone slabs. Presumably, these functioned like the stone tram lines meant to help carry a heavy object, such as a wheeled brazier. Behind the throne was a large relief scene of the king depicted on either side of the sacred tree. Above the sacred tree was the winged disc of the god Ashur, supreme god of the Assyrian Empire. Behind both images of the king were genii with the cone and bucket. This scene was repeated in the center of the southern wall. There is no evidence to show that there was also a throne in front of the second instance of the scene, but it has been suggested that the placement of the scene on the southern wall was due to an entrance into the room on the northern side. Thus, this would mean that the viewer would have seen the scene on his way into the room and then turned to see the king on his throne above whom the viewer would see the same scene. This repetition of scenes controls the organization and pivot points of the throne room. The author stats with full-size figures carved in relief measured about 2.2 meters above the ground, 2.7 meters in total, as they were sunk into the ground for support. The actual walls were 6 to 8 meters high, so even the towering image of the king took up less than half the height of the wall. Across the center of many of the scenes on these large orthostats was an inscription, often referred to as the standard inscription, as the same inscription was used on all of them. This inscription had a short version of the titles and achievements in 18 to 26 lines of Ashur Nasipal II. Along the north and south walls were the narrative reliefs. This type of historical narrative relief is new at this time, appearing first here at the new capital established by Assur Nasipal II. This type of historical narrative relief did not appear at Assur for the thousand years before this that Assyrian kings ruled from that city. There may have been a correlation with the new expansionist activities of the empire fulfilling new imperial needs. These were arranged in two tiers, with a band of inscription between the two tiers. Many of the reliefs from the north wall are missing, but the reliefs that have been preserved show specific battles on the edges of the Assyrian Empire. These same battles are also discussed in the annals of Assur Nasipal II. On the southern wall, the eastern end of the wall contains scenes of bull and lion hunts. These reinforce the idea of the king as a vigorous and victorious hunter, also playing on a master of animals theme that goes back to the earliest images in Mesopotamia. Moving west, there are a series of battle and tribute scenes. Battle scenes have also been a common theme in Mesopotamian art until this time, but one innovation during this period was the specificity of the scenes to actual historical events, and the narration of these events while still using stock themes and images. The battle scenes of the throne room included both battles on the field and sieges. At the far west end is the doorway to room C. Opposite the doorway was likely a scene of the seated king with a cup 
flanked by attendants and winged genii. The layout of these reliefs in the throne room is important, as it is paralleled in the standard inscription written over all of them, and therefore central to how Ashur Nasipal II was attempting to present himself as a king. The standard inscription described the king both as a ferocious predator, paralleled in the hunting scenes on the south wall, and a conqueror of the cities and the entire highlands, paralleled in the battle scenes on the north wall. Meanwhile, the king would be on his throne, awaiting visitors, paralleling the standard inscription's attentive prince, with an image of him anointing the sacred tree below the disk of Ashur behind him, paralleling worshipper of the great gods. Thus, the throne room is a microcosm of the empire, with the king at its center. At least some of the details of these stone reliefs were once painted. Evidence of black paint has been found on reliefs of beards, hair, and eyes, while evidence of red paint has been found on sandals. Indeed, it may be that the full reliefs were once painted bright colors, and above the reliefs seem to have been brightly colored paintings, with even the ceiling decorated. The surviving painted decoration found by excavators included rosettes, images of officials, and patterns in red and white against a blue background. The layout of the throne room is a conventional bent axis plan. This layout has been seen in cult rooms in Mesopotamia for 2,000 years before this palace was built. The throne room, however, is just one part of a larger reception suite. This type of suite regularly included a throne room, an anteroom, and a large courtyard, as seen as early as the early 2nd millennium BC in Mari. On the west side of the throne room is a large doorway leading into room C. This doorway is clearly important, as it is marked by winged bull colossi facing the throne room. There is also a large stairwell in this area leading to the room. The exact ceremonial function of the stairwell is unknown, but there was a clear connection between this type of stairwell and a reception room in ancient Mesopotamia. It may be that some sort of ceremony took place on the roof, which may also account for the unusually thick walls in this area of the palace. The most dazzling finds from the Northwest Palace come from the tombs below the southern part of the building. British archaeologist Max Mallowan had found a terracotta coffin with a female skeleton and the so-called Nimrud jewel below room DD. Mallowan described this grave as having belonged to a princess. The Nimrud jewel was a stamp seal, and was attached to a gold chain. The seal is an oval pendant of mauve chalcedony, a form of silica, engraved with two figures playing pipes on either side of the sacred tree. Four tombs were discovered in this area during work done by the Iraq Department of Antiquities. The excavation, led by Muzahim Mahmud, found vessels made of precious metals and a large amount of gold jewelry. It is thought that these tombs belong to Assyrian queens. Tomb 1 was discovered in the spring of 1988, when the Iraqi team began removing the brick floor in the center of room MM. Malawan had excavated room MM, but had never searched underneath the baked brick pavement. About 20 centimeters below the surface of the floor, the team found a grave of a woman buried in a baked clay coffin. The discovery of this grave led the team to search the rest of the room, and in the northern part of the room, they exposed the top of a baked brick vault. The vault was the roof of a subterranean chamber. The bricks used were stamped with the titles of Ashur Nasipal II. It is likely that this tomb was built at the same time as the palace itself. The tomb held a terracotta sarcophagus with a human skeleton, likely a female in her fifties. There were many stamp seals of high quality in this tomb, suggesting that the owner may have had a special administrative function. Much of the jewelry of this tomb was common to the other three tombs as well, but this tomb did not include a headdress. There were also three erotic figurines made of faience, tin-glazed pottery, found inside the sarcophagus. Tomb 2 was discovered in 1989, while the team was excavating parts of the Northwest Palace that had never been archaeologically explored before. Southwest of Courtyard A.J., they found a room, now labeled Room 43, with a decorated stone threshold. 
Room 43 had access to what became Room 46 and Courtyard 56. Excavations west of Rooms 43 and 46 found Room 44, an L-shaped corridor, which seemed to function as a link between two parts of the domestic wing of the palace. Branching off from Room 44 were two other corridors, Rooms 50 and 51. Corridor Room 51 led to Courtyard 55 and also Room 49. Underneath Room 49 is where excavators discovered Tomb 2. In a niche in the wall of the outer chamber, excavators found an inscribed marble tablet indicating that this was the tomb of Yaba, Queen of Tiglath-Pileser III. A large white calcite sarcophagus was at the northern end of the burial chamber. A number of items were found throughout the chamber, including many which may have originally been used in a funerary meal. Inside the sarcophagus was a great deal of ash and cloth, along with two bodies, one on top of the other. Around the bodies and among the layers of cloth were more than 700 objects, a great deal of which consisted of gold jewellery. It is presumed that the lower body was Queen Yaba, who was also mentioned on two gold bowls from the tomb. The other body may be Atalia, one of two other queens mentioned on objects in the tomb and mentioned on a gold bowl on the breast of the upper body. The other two queens mentioned in the tomb were Atalia, wife of Sargon II, and Banitu, wife of Shalmaneser V. If the second body is Atalia, Banitu's remains may be in alabaster jars in the east niche, containing human bones, and or a jar in the west niche, containing the remains of a human brain. A crown and a diadem were found with the skeleton. Colon suggests that the crown was associated with the upper skeleton, making the diadem a masterpiece of woven gold associated with the lower skeleton. Many of the items in this tomb have been described as masterpieces, both in Assyrian and foreign style. There are also many more mundane items in the tomb. These items in pottery, bronze, wood and ivory give insight into funerary practices of the time. Tomb 3 was discovered underneath room 57. This room is south of room 49 and entered through courtyard 55. Room 57 had a large number of tablets in it, the majority of which record business dealings of officials during the reigns of Adad-Nirari III and Tiglath-Pileser III. This makes this group of roughly 150 tablets contemporary with the archive at the Governor's Palace. Underneath the floor, the excavators found the damaged tomb vault for Tomb 3. The bricks in the vault were inscribed with the names of Ashur Nasipal II and Shalmaneser III. Construction of the tomb was likely finished under the latter king. Inside the tomb, a limestone sarcophagus was found, but it had been completely looted. Below the floor of the burial chamber was a grey alabaster sarcophagus, inscribed with the name Mulisu Mukanishat Ninua. A marble tablet with a similar inscription was found in a niche in the outer chamber. In the same chamber, excavators found three bronze coffins, coffins one to three. Inscriptions on the funerary artifacts date as early as Adadnirari III but there was also mention of General Samshi Ilu, who served kings Shalmaneser IV, Ashur Dan III, and Ashur Nirari V. Among the three coffins were remains of at least twelve individuals. Coffin I contained an adult female, four children, and a fully grown fetus. Along with these individuals, excavators also found a large quantity of jewellery and vessels made of gold, amulets, precious stones, and beads. Given the wealth of the items, the woman was likely of high rank and importance. Coffin 2 was found underneath Coffin 1. Inside were the remains of a woman, 18 to 20 years old. A stamp seal found inside suggests that this is likely Queen Hama, consort of Shalmaneser IV. She was buried in an elaborate gold crown, possibly from Anatolia, and Urashian bracelets, leading some to suggest that the queen was originally from Anatolia. Coffin 3 was immediately west of Coffin 2. This coffin likely had the remains of five individuals, but this was likely a secondary deposit, as the bones were not well preserved. 
The items in this coffin were not as elaborate as coffins one and two, but the individuals were still clearly of high status. Tomb four was discovered in room 72, south of the area where tombs two and three were discovered. Inside the burial chamber was a large stone sarcophagus, originally covered by slabs of terracotta. This tomb was robbed in antiquity, but enough was left to reconstruct a similar burial to the other queen's tombs. The Fall of Nimrud During the reign of Sargon II, 721 to 705 BC, the Assyrian capital was moved to Khorsabad. Sinashirib would later move the capital again, this time to Nineveh. With that, Nimrud, or Kalhu, once again became more of a provincial capital, ruled by a governor who reported to the king. The royal archives of Kalhu still included letters to Sargon II, especially as he did not move the capital immediately upon taking power. Furthermore, the city retained a certain importance, since royal women continue to be buried in the queen's tombs of the Northwest Palace. S.R. Hatton continued to undertake building projects at the site, probably including rebuilding part of Fort Shamanisa. Nimrud was eventually destroyed, along with other Assyrian centers by the Medes, in 64-612 BC, but archaeological evidence indicates that after the city was destroyed, the survivors returned to the city where remains of the monumental buildings became shelters. This squatter lifestyle likely didn't last long. The people only squatted in the fortified areas, such as the citadel and the arsenal, so it was clear that they remained afraid even after the city had been sacked. Indeed, archaeologists believe these survivors suffered a violent end, possibly at the hands of peoples from the northeast. After the destruction of the city, there is little evidence of occupation before the Hellenistic period. Excavators found Neo-Babylonian graves dug into the walls of the palace of Adad-Nirari III, and there are traces of later rebuilding and reoccupation during the Achaemenid period in the Northwest Palace, the Burnt Palace, the Nabu Temple, the Southeast Palace, and houses in TW53. Also from this period was a workshop with kilns for the production of glass in the Burnt Palace. This confirms the observations of Xenophon, who called the site Larissa in 401 BC. During the time of Ashur Nasipal II, the Tigris River was close to the western wall of the city, but by the time of Xenophon, the river was two or three kilometers away from the city. The change of course of the river may have been part of the reason that the city did not maintain a steady population in these later times. In the Hellenistic or Seleucid period, there is evidence of a succession of settlements dating from about 240 to 140 BC in the southeast part of the citadel. Both Layard's and Malouan's excavations at the site mentioned many Hellenistic tombs, especially in the southeastern and central parts of the Tell. It is unclear if the settlements continued into the Parthian and Sasanian periods, after which the site was largely unoccupied. As the Islamic State ripped through the Middle East, it destroyed ancient sites in its wake, and since Nimrud predated Islam and was considered un-Islamic, it was one such site to be destroyed. In 2016, much of the site was found to be covered in rubble, which was no surprise, since the Islamic State had videotaped blowing up and smashing monuments in the ancient city after they captured it in June 2014. By March 2015, there were reports of its members using bulldozers at the site, releasing videos of their damage the following month. In November 2016, Iraqi forces retook the city, and when the damage was assessed, it was found that the Northwest Palace, the Nabu Temple, and the Ziggurat were all completely leveled and destroyed. Archaeologists were happy that the rubble was still at the site, leading to hopes that something may be rescued from the site, but the site has been left unsecured, and looters have likely stripped this rubble for valuable artifacts. Nimrud is only one of the sites lost in recent years. In addition to blowing up Nimrud, the Islamic State also blew up much of the ancient city of Hatra and the city of Palmyra in Syria. Many of Iraq's cultural heritage sites were destroyed beginning in 2003, when many archaeological sites in southern Iraq were heavily looted in the wake of fighting in the area. 
The National Museum of Baghdad was looted in 2003 as well, putting many extremely famous artifacts on the black market. Approximately 15,000 items were stolen in a matter of days, marking a huge loss for the culture of the region. And in 2015, Islamic State members attacked the Mosul Museum, destroying many artifacts inside. The fate of many of these objects remains unknown, including the great throne base of Ashur Nasipal II from Nimrud. Many of the items in the museum were undoubtedly destroyed in the attack, but some may have been sold to fund Islamic State activities, and the hunt for stolen items continues to this day. The market for these items provides an incentive to looters, and the record sale of a relief from Nimrud last year has only fueled the fear of further looting. As all of this turbulent history makes clear, the ancient Assyrian site of Nimrud had a long important history, especially during its time as capital of the great Neo-Assyrian Empire. The buildings at the site were monumental, as evidenced by the reliefs and statues found in museums around the world today. Throughout all its history, and with all of its names, this site is one that continues to inspire today, and thankfully, many of its artifacts live on in museums, allowing visitors to imagine what it would have been like to walk through the grand capital of a powerful ancient empire. This has been the Assyrian Empire's Capitals, the history and legacy of Nineveh, Asher, and Nimrud. Written by Charles River Editors. Narrated by Colin Pluxman. Copyright 2019 by Charles River Editors. Production Copyright 2019 by Charles River Editors. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.